Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Fringe, Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first episode begins with an ugly driver waking up in a car, seemingly having been in an accident. He bolts from the vehicle and runs into a dilapidated building. Without a word, he knocks out a bald man, then pulls out a device with two plugs. He inserts one plug into the bald man's upper jaw and the other into his own. Then something magical happens. His face starts to contort and eventually it morphs into the face of the bald man. The mysterious device looks like a beauty product, and now the ugly driver makes himself good-looking, despite being bald. Soon after, the FBI discovers the scene of the car crash. The owner of another black car at the scene is revealed to be Olivia, an FBI agent. As a result, the eccentric scientist, Dr. Walter, rush over together with his son, Peter. They find the black car empty, with no sign of Olivia. Suddenly, the car's lights flash, and Olivia's heavy body is ejected from the vehicle, landing heavily on the ground. She is rushed to the hospital, where the doctors declare her brain dead and beyond help. Frustrated, Peter drowns his sorrows at a bar. The head officer, Philip, also arrives, planning to keep Peter company. Philip mentions that too many people died last season, and the higher-ups are not happy. Plans are underway to dissolve the Fringe Department, which is the investigation team for paranormal events. Meanwhile, the assistant cop, who is investigating the car crash, senses that there's something unusual about this group. So she conducts a secret investigation. Somehow, she has acquired the necessary clearance to access the system, and she is stunned by the nature of the cases she finds. There is not a single normal case. Peter brings in Olivia's sister, who reveals that Olivia once said she didn't want to be kept alive artificially, so they decide to let Olivia pass away the next morning. The sister also reveals that Olivia had a secret crush on Peter. That night, Peter comes to bid Olivia farewell, regretting being unable to tongue massage her before she was alive. Suddenly, Olivia's eyes snap open as if she's come back to life, but Peter isn't startled. Olivia utters a strange phrase in Greek and gets up. After checking, everything seems normal on Olivia, except for some memory loss. She mentions that someone told her something important that she needed to do, but she can't remember what it was. Since she suddenly emerged from the car, they figure she must have crossed over from a parallel universe. At the end of last season, Olivia finally met the legendary scientist Dr. Bell, the boss of the massive dynamic who kept testing on human bodies to create super soldiers, so she suspects that this happening is likely related to him. At this point, the police retrieve the crash surveillance, identifying the runaway ugly driver. Soon after, they arrive at his house, only to find him dead as shit. It appears that the ugly driver, too, must have shapeshifted from someone else. Dr. Walter hopes to take the body back to the lab, but this is denied because their fringe department is about to be dissolved and they've likely lost their authority. However, with the assistant cop's help, Dr. Walter finally gets his wish. The scene shifts to the transformed imposter of the bald man, who enters a typewriter store and then a secret room. Inside the room is a typewriter. He types his actions onto a paper, claiming he has successfully completed his mission, having taken out Olivia in a fatal car crash and successfully prevented a meeting. Suddenly, the typewriter in the mirror starts typing on its own, replying the mission had failed and he needed to continue the mission because Olivia isn't dead. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter notices plug marks on the corpse's upper jaw. He suddenly recalls a past event, even finding an old video. The video features a girl who claims to have seen a warrior not from their world, who used a device to change his appearance to that of someone else. Upon hearing this, Peter became concerned, fearing for Olivia's safety. He quickly asks the lab assistant Astrid to check if there are any other bodies with plug marks on their upper jaws. They soon find one, the body of the bald man. This means that the shapeshifter might currently look like this bald. However, little did they know the bald shapeshifter has already targeted a nurse as his shapeshifting victim. Obviously, the shapeshifter is now sick of his bald life and wants to cosplay the charming nurse. At the moment, the charming nurse comes to check on Olivia's condition, and it's clear that she is actually the shapeshifter. The charming nurse climbs onto Olivia, planning to strangle her to end her sexy life. Just at this critical moment, the assistant cop arrives in time, firing two shots at the nurse. But the nurse, unharmed and still charming, jumps out of the window and escapes in a charming way, moving with ease from such a high floor, just like a flying chicken. Peter and the cop, Charlie, chase after her, ending up in a basement. Charlie and encounters the charming nurse and fires a few shots at her charming body. Peter and the assistant arrive at the sound of gunshots, only to see that Charlie has killed her without hormone mercy. On the floor is the magical beauty device for shapeshifting. Afterwards, Peter tells Olivia about the Greek phrase she muttered when she woke up from the car incident. Olivia shakes her head, unable to remember. 
Peter explains that the phrase was something his mother used to tell him every night, meaning be a better person than your father. Peter hands over the shape-shifting device to the head officer, Philip, to bring to the higher-ups. Dr. Walter states that the beauty device isn't from this world. If they can research this technology, they could have an army capable of shape-shifting at will. And most important of all, they could make themselves much more handsome. But in exchange, the fringe department can't be disbanded. Towards the end, Charlie prepares to burn a pile of trash. He picks up a piece of trash, only to find another Charlie inside. In fact, this is the real Charlie who was thrown into the fire by the shapeshifter. The second episode begins with a construction worker who just finished his shift and was preparing to head home. Suddenly, he noticed something unusual in the bushes. Out of curiosity, he approached and saw a blue object. Just as he reached out to touch it, something yanked him underground. Luckily, he survived with his shitty life unharmed. However, he discovered an intricate network of tunnels filled with human remains. An underground creature then lunged at him. The scene shifts to Philip telling Peter that thanks to his idea, their superiors agreed to retain the fringe department. Peter congratulates him and shares news about six mysterious disappearances in a small town, similar to Olivia's vanishing act from the car. There might be a connection worth investigating. In the lab, Dr. Walter is conducting experiments. Olivia has been discharged from the hospital but still walks with a cane due to her lingering illness. The doctor updates her about the situation. News reports claim that Olivia was thrown from the car, suggesting high speed, but the circumstances were unlikely. This led to his speculation that Olivia might have visited a parallel world for at least an hour. The scene shifts to the imposter Charlie visiting the typewriter shop. He communicates with someone using the mysterious typewriter. The person on the other end suggests that since his colleague Olivia trusts him currently, he should not kill her yet and should try to extract some clues first. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter visit the small town to investigate the disappearance of the construction worker. They investigate a nearby resident named Hughes. Olivia hears a subtle noise, suggesting someone else in the house, but Peter hears nothing. Olivia seems to have developed a keen sense of hearing. They find nothing in the house, and the accidental shot by Olivia most scares Peter to wet his pants. Olivia still suspects Hughes and brings him to the police station. Hughes, a retired doctor, denies knowing the missing people, but appears nervous and refuses to provide DNA samples. Nina, the executive director of Massive Dynamics, approaches Olivia and conducts several tests. She gives Olivia an address for a doctor named Sam, assuring her that he could help with any mental or physical changes she's experiencing. Soon after, investigations reveal that Hughes's wife died in childbirth 17 years ago. The FBI decides to exhume her body for an autopsy, but detained Hughes is furious about this and bites the iron line intending for something. When the FBI opens the two coffins, they find the adult's remains, but the child's coffin is empty, with a hole at the bottom and a corresponding hole in the ground. Olivia quickly locates Hughes, only to find that he has killed himself. His earlier act in the cell was a setup for his own death. Hughes's wife's remains are sent to Dr. Walter, who discovers that she had lupus, a disease rendering her incapable of childbirth. This raises a question. If that is the case, where did Hughes's child come from? Meanwhile, Olivia's hearing becomes increasingly sensitive, allowing her even to hear sounds from miles away. In the lab, Dr. Walter concludes that Hughes's previous profession was genetic modification. If he had implanted the genes of some underground creature onto a fetus, such as the DNA of a certain scorpion species, it could have counteracted lupus and allowed a child to be born. However, the child also mutated due to the mixed DNA, turning into something like a ghoul, which is possibly the same creature attacking the construction worker previously. Olivia arrives and suggests that the sound she heard at Hughes's house was likely his child. Since there was no one at home, he might be underground. Hence, Olivia and Peter decide to investigate Hughes's house again. They discover a secret room in Hughes's house, which is clearly a baby's room. One wall of the room is made entirely of soil, and when they dig it open, it leads straight underground. Suddenly, the ghoul jumps out to flex its monstrous figure, bites Olivia, and drags her sexy body deeper. Peter rushes to follow and manages to save Olivia, engaging in a struggle with the ghoul. After several rounds of two against one, they manage to drive the ghoul away. The ghoul quickly starts digging a hole hole to escape for its monstrous life, but unfortunately causes a collapse that brings down a car, crushing itself into smelly turds. Olivia returns home and takes a bath, but she starts hearing sounds from miles away again. She thinks she will be functioning like a satellite soon, and she needs to get a health check on herself. So she goes to the address Nina gave her and finds Dr. Sam, who informs her that this is just the beginning and she will suffer from splitting headaches. 
The third episode starts with a police officer on duty who suddenly receives a phone call. The caller claims to be a colonel and instructs him to go to the station to find a man in a black coat carrying a black briefcase and to retrieve the briefcase. The obedient officer goes over and indeed finds such a person. Suddenly, the lights and screens start flickering. After the officer snatches the briefcase, his arm freezes, followed by his entire body, and then he explodes. The explosion is massive, almost blowing up the entire station. The surveillance at the scene also malfunctioned during the explosion, capturing nothing. At the scene, Dr. Walter finds an object that looks like an ear. He licks it and finds it tasty, saying that it's organic. Soon after, the officer's identity is revealed. His name is Gillespie. Dr. Walter also mentions that there are over a hundred pinpricks on Gillespie's souls, suggesting he might have been injected with a serum that could turn him into a bomb. So, Olivia and Peter head over to Gillespie's house to investigate. During the investigation, Olivia suddenly suffers from a splitting headache and starts seeing some familiar images. It seems Dr. Sam's prediction was right. Olivia feels so nauseous that she needs to use the bathroom, where she unexpectedly finds a box of serum and syringes. It seems this is what Gillespie injected. Olivia asks Gillespie's wife about it, but she says she has never seen it before. The scene changes to a blonde woman named Diane, who takes out a vial of serum identical to the one previously seen and injects herself with it. It seems that Gillespie isn't the only one who has used this serum. At this moment, a colonel approaches. He must be the person who was in contact with Gillespie earlier. He hands Diane a phone and tells her to await further instructions. Olivia seeks out Sam and says that she started to get headaches, asking for his medical advice. Sam nonchalantly starts to tie his shoelaces and replies, there's nothing to do. Olivia becomes furious and demands him to give her some medication instead of tying his shoes. But Sam replies that he was simply trying to train her patients. In the lab, Dr. Walter finds out the serum is harmless unless it's activated, believing that there must be some sort of trigger that sets it off. Peter suggests that it might be radio waves, given that all lights, screens, and surveillance systems failed during the previous incident. At this point, they find out that Gillespie had once served in Iraq, and his squad was bombed with hydrogen chloride gas. Considering they weren't likely to survive anyway, they participated in something called the Iron Man Project. All the specific details have been erased. Only the name of the doctor involved is retained. Thus, Peter and Olivia head to Iraq to investigate. Peter contacts a friend to assist in locating the doctor. This friend proves to be very helpful and finds the doctor in no time. It turns out that the doctor has long since stopped practicing medicine and has become a chef instead. He reveals that the Iron Man project was named so because they invented an antidote, which is the serum, capable of counteracting the toxins. However, not everyone could be saved by it. Most people still died except for Gillespie and one other survivor named Diane, the blonde woman who also injected herself with the serum. Gradually, they discover that this serum not only cures diseases, but can also turn them into human bombs. Therefore, the higher-ups ordered the project's shutdown. However, a colonel strongly opposed this decision, making him a prime suspect. Knowing that, Philip convenes an emergency meeting and issues an order to apprehend the colonel. They plan to use Diane to lure out the colonel, given Dr. Walter's statement that the serum can be triggered by radio waves, but the distance can't be too far. Meanwhile, Diane has just received a call from the colonel. Her mission is to snatch a black briefcase from a man in a black coat. Diane easily locates this person and is about to steal the briefcase when the colonel activates the radio. Diane's arm starts to freeze, and it seems an explosion is imminent. Luckily, Peter finds the colonel and incapacitates him, while Olivia destroys the radio transmitter, thus preventing a massive explosion. After that, Olivia goes to Dr. Sam for treatment once again. He instructs her to tie his shoes, and Olivia reaches her breaking point. She pulls out a gun and threatens to shoot his tofu brain, but when she turns around, she realizes she's no longer reliant on her crutch, and her hands have stopped shaking. In the detention room, the colonel shockingly reveals that these men in black coats with briefcases aren't from this world. They are here to observe mankind. The briefcases contain information they've gathered, which could destroy Earth. Meanwhile, another man in a black coat passes his briefcase to another person. This individual is none other than the bald observer, the same mysterious figure shown up in the previous season. Shockingly, inside the briefcase are photos of Dr. Walter, indicating that he might be the next target. The fourth episode begins with four employees of a human organ trafficking organization preparing to transport a pile of frozen human heads. Suddenly, an unexpected burly guy arrives. He pulls out a gun and promptly shoots down two of the men, then another. He leaves the last one alive because he is an insider. 
They prepare to hijack the vehicle and escape, but suddenly a shot rings out, hitting the thin man. It turns out one of their victims wasn't entirely dead. The burly guy sees this and decisively abandons his partner, choosing to flee by himself. The thin man, despite being shot several times, doesn't die. Ultimately, he's taken down by a headshot, behaving almost like a zombie. A pool of silver substance oozes from him. The case is quickly taken over by the FBI. They discover a shape-shifting device on the thin man, implying that he was also a shapeshifter. Seeing this, the imposter Charlie remarks about the lack of professionalism. He confronts the burly guy about their lackluster disposal of the bodies. The burly guy dismisses his bullshit, advising him to change his body to avoid death. Imposter Charlie reluctantly reveals that his shape-shifting device is broken and has been confiscated. The burly guy suggests going back to their original world to get another one, but Charlie laments that he's been asked to work overtime. The burly guy examines the last head, finds it's not what he wants, and throws it by the river. It seems they're looking for a very special skull. In the lab, Dr. Walter dissects the thin man, concluding that he is not human, but a combination of high-tech machinery and an organic entity. His blood is 47% mercury, enabling him to transform freely and retain his appearance. Realizing the implications, Dr. Walter urgently calls Olivia back. He reveals that the shapeshifter they found earlier, the charming nurse from the first episode, had normal blood with no traces of mercury, implying that she's not a real shapeshifter. The real shapeshifters might still be hiding among them. However, Dr. Walter has good news. He has a way to identify the shapeshifters. He brings out a video from the first episode featuring a girl named Rebecca. After long-term drug experiments under Dr. Walter, she has developed a superpower that allows her to distinguish people not from this world. The method involves looking into their eyes. If they're not from this world, an unusual glow will flicker around them. Olivia delivers two shapeshifting devices to the Massive Dynamics Corporation, hoping that its director needs can decipher them and reveal their final form. The scientist there says it will require time for the data to generate slowly. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter and Peter decided to find Rebecca and use her unique ability to identify shapeshifters. Dr. Walter told his son Peter to knock on the door instead. He didn't dare to face her because he had been harsh with her in the past with the medications. To their surprise, when they opened the door, the sexy Rebecca embraced Dr. Walter, but without a kiss. Dr. Walter was surprised to ask if she still hated him. Rebecca denied that, saying she felt grateful to him because he had made her special. She admitted that she could indeed identify those not from this world, but her ability had deteriorated from disuse. When Dr. Walter asked if she would help him again, Rebecca excitedly agreed, saying she had been wanting to revisit the experience. Thus, she laid down on the experimental bed and soon fell into a hypnotic state. Peter rang a bell to trigger the hypnosis, but instead of affecting Rebecca, it caused Olivia to faint as a flood of memories rushed back to her. She remembered meeting Dr. Bell in a parallel universe. Bell said that he's trapped there and couldn't return yet, and that others had already crossed over to this human world. They were the first wave, and also sent shapeshifters back to their original world, attempting to reopen the gateway between the two worlds. He told Olivia to stop them because they are now looking for someone who can open the portal. If they succeed in opening the portal to the human world, mankind will be completely destroyed. Bell also drew a picture of a device that looked like earbuds, saying that the shapeshifters were looking for a person marked with this symbol. He suggested that she could ask Nina for help. Bell's last words were in Greek, which she had already relayed to Peter, be a better man than your father. Because traveling between two worlds generates a lot of momentum that must be released, this explains why Olivia ended up being thrown from the car. When Olivia woke up, she was calling for Nina. As they were leaving Rebecca, Dr. Walter volunteered to drive her home and even asked his son for some spending money. It seemed like he was experiencing a revival of his romance. As they were saying goodbye, Rebecca noticed a shimmering aura around Peter's head. She was puzzled, wondering if Peter was a shapeshifter, but she dismissed it, thinking that it must be the effects of the drugs. However, this clue hinted that Peter isn't from this world to begin with. When Olivia met with Nina, she relayed Bell's message. Nina explained that according to the Pauli exclusion principle, if two identical things occupy the same point in space, and if the portals to two worlds were opened, there would inevitably be a conflict. Olivia had another flash of vision. Bell had also drawn an address on the symbol. That was where the shapeshifters were looking for the skull. Then, she received a text from her colleague Charlie, warning that Nina was a shapeshifter and to be careful. 
Olivia later thanked the fake Charlie for his warning, saying she almost disclosed the address to Nina. When the fake Charlie asked about the address, Olivia told him directly. Just as she finished speaking, an image generated from the shape-shifting devices came through. Olivia was shocked to see it was Charlie. Realizing something was off, she wrestled her skinny muscles with imposter Charlie. After knocking Olivia down, the fake Charlie called his accomplice and revealed the address. The two then resumed fighting, with Olivia ultimately blowing the fake Charlie's head off. Despite all her efforts, it was all in vain. The burly guy, who was also a shapeshifter, found the marked skull and successfully assembled it. The fifth story begins with a salary man who seems distracted at work. No matter who he sees, they all look like disfigured ghosts to him. When he enters the meeting room, it appears as if he's seeing a terrifying demon lord. His office feels like hell. It seems like the ghosts have come to take his soul. But the man is definitely not ready to meet Satan. In order to survive, he fights back and kills the demon lord, his eyes wildly darting in all directions. However, all this is just an illusion. The demon lord he killed is actually his boss. Consequently, the incident is taken over by the fringe department. The salary man doesn't understand what's happening. He speaks a few words before convulsing and dying, his hair turning white in an instant. This excites Dr. Walter to act like a psycho. The stranger the phenomenon, the more excited he gets. Dr. Walter takes a look and concludes that it's clearly a case of adrenaline surge and death from overwork and shock. Later, Olivia and Peter find the man's wife and continue their investigation. The wife says her husband was a very sociable person and had never shown violent tendencies. He just had some sleep issues and often suffered from insomnia. He had seen a psychiatrist and even kept a sleep diary. The diary reveals that he dreamt of the devil once a week on average, which corresponds with his ghostly hallucinations. Meanwhile, in the lab, Dr. Walter finds a chip in the salary man's hypothalamus. The chip is produced by a sleep treatment organization to treat sleep disorders. So, Olivia and Peter visit this organization for investigation. The director named Dr. Nyack says that the chip is only used to improve sleep and even if it malfunctions, it would be benign and wouldn't cause any negative effects. Just as he finishes speaking, he discovers that someone has broken into his office and stolen all the patient's records. Fortunately, there's a backup server that requires a password, which probably wasn't stolen. So, Olivia asks her superior, Philip, for investigation support. Peter believes that the chip in the hypothalamus could not only control sleep, but also a person's actions. Therefore, it's likely that someone stole the information and committed the crime through mind control. Dr. Walter agrees and says he needs a test subject to verify this. Peter quickly interjects, insisting that they can't use student volunteers. The doctor agrees, glancing sideways as long as it's not a student. This FBI newbie might be a good candidate for the trial. Elsewhere, someone is secretly reading the biometric chips of the patients in the dark. This time, it's a female chef. She suddenly becomes distracted and sees her ugly colleague using human flesh as ingredients and cooking delicious dishes. Angered and armed with a knife, she charges at her colleague like a mad cow. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter takes the opportunity to drug the FBI newbie, preparing to use him as a test subject. At this point, Philip calls Olivia to inform her that the data in the backup server has also been stolen, but there are no signs of external intrusion, suggesting it's likely an inside job. So, Olivia goes back to question Dr. Nyack. Nyack says that all the staff know the password as it's necessary for their work. Olivia insists that he needs to suspect someone. Nyack, stammering, suggests they investigate his assistant, who hasn't been answering his calls all day. Something must be wrong with him. After Olivia and Peter leave, Nyack finds a threatening note slipped under his door. It warns that if Nyack continues to cooperate with the FBI, he will lose his chicken life. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter go to the said assistant's house, only to find him murdered in his own closet. Nyack hands over the discovered note to Olivia, then makes a phone call, telling the man on the other end to stop now because he had given his note to the police. This indicates that Nyack might know who the murderer is. Inside the lab, after conducting experiments on the FBI newbie, Dr. Walter discovers this isn't about mind control. The function of these biometric chips is to extract dreams, allowing the person to sleep like a pig without dreaming, thereby naturally improving their sleep issues. The person who stole the patient's records was in fact stealing these patients' dreams. But why would someone want to steal others' dreams? Because it's exhilarating for those dream-peeping Toms, experiencing the target's secrets and fantasies 
fantasies is such a thrilling thing. The murderer of this case is likely an addict who enjoys experiencing others' dreams. Olivia suddenly claims she might know who the murderer is and heads back to the hotel with Peter. Olivia explains that addicts generally have a dual personality. One moment clear-headed, the next manic. If severe, they can become schizophrenic. Olivia takes out the threatening letter Nyack received and the list of patient names he had written, only to notice they're written in the same handwriting. At the same time, Dr. Nyack returns home to find a voice message that is his own. It's the call he made during the day, asking someone to stop. It turns out he was the real culprit all the time. Now he decided to experience someone else's dream one last time. He selected another target. This time it's a pilot. The plane is taking off. Suddenly he hallucinates, seeing the co-pilot's face vanish, looking like a duck egg. How can he fly the plane like this? The plane is about to crash into a cruise ship. At the critical moment, Olivia and her team arrive at Nyack's house, destroying the machine, saving the pilot, and averting disaster. Nyack himself, due to extreme mental tension, dies in the process. In the end, Peter has a nightmare where he's kidnapped as a child, but this isn't a dream. It really happened to him, but he just forgot the part. The sixth episode begins as a beautiful woman comes home to a delightful surprise. Her husband has bought her a bouquet of roses. It turns out today is their wedding anniversary. She is happy, but after speaking a few sentences, her husband doesn't respond. Something feels off. Not only is he ignoring her, but he's also very stiff. Wondering what surprise could be in store, she reaches out to touch him and discovers her husband has already turned into a pile of dust. After taking the case and examining, Dr. Walter says it's reminiscent of when firewood burns out. Although it turns to powder, it still retains its original form. As for the reason, it's hard to say right now. They'll have to vacuum up the ashes and bring them back to the lab for further research. Philip glances at the dust and concludes that this person definitely visited a hospital within the past 24 hours. Olivia is surprised and asks how the hell he knows that. Philip explains that a similar thing happened four years ago. The murderer killed five people and then disappeared. All the victims had visited Tyson Hospital in Washington. At that time, someone wanted to surrender on the condition that the police decipher a molecular equation he provided. It seemed to be a complex organic compound. Despite many top scientists studying it day and night, they couldn't figure it out. But then the murderer stopped killing, and the case was eventually dropped. Until last night, when another victim appeared. Could it be that the mysterious killer is making a comeback? At this moment, Olivia receives news, confirming Philip's conjecture. The deceased victim had indeed visited a hospital, the Mitchell Hospital. The scene shifts to a shadow flickering down the corridor of Mitchell Hospital, causing a worker to panic. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter states his findings that everything has some level of radioactivity, but this man's ashes have a radiation level of zero. It's as if something has drained it away, and they have no clue about the chemical formula yet. Olivia and Philip stay at Mitchell Hospital, fearing any potential mishaps. Unfortunately, their fears come true when another woman in the hospital is turned into dust, despite no suspicious individuals being seen entering or exiting the hospital. Meanwhile, through an investigation, it's discovered that a man named Thomas, who worked at Tyson Hospital in Washington four years ago and is now employed at Mitchell Hospital, vanished a few days ago. He is highly suspected to be the serial killer killer. Consequently, the FBI raids Thomas's home, only to find it empty, but they discover parts labeled in Russian, suggesting Thomas could be Russian. Olivia retrieves surveillance footage, revealing an eerie specter. Philip, pulling some strings, locates a classified document stating that Thomas has a brother, a former Soviet astronaut who once walked in space. After returning to Earth, he fell into a coma, and the Russian government declared him dead in service. However, he didn't die, but was instead taken away by his brother, Thomas. Dr. Walter concludes in the lab that this specter can pass through a human body, absorbing all radioactive material and pulverizing the body. The equation is on the verge of being deciphered. The scene shifts again as Thomas cuts off the power to Mitchell Hospital, sneaks in and removes a person. It's his astronaut brother. Dr. Walter proposes a theory that a mysterious creature might have attached itself to Thomas's brother during his spacewalk and has been residing in him ever since, even occasionally manifesting as the specter. The Soviet Union concealed this discovery to conduct secret research, but lost control when Thomas took him away. The equation is the result of the fusion of the specter and Thomas's brother. Philip suggests leaving a voice message for Thomas, who once left his phone number to the police, claiming they can solve the equation, hoping to lure him out. 
Upon hearing the message, Thomas raised his interest. It turns out that all his actions were to figure out the equation to save his brother, who was tormented by the shadow. Seeing his brother at death's door, he moved him from hospital to hospital in an attempt to save him, but without success. The string of murders was done by the specter and wrongly blamed on Thomas. His hope was to separate the specter from his brother's body, so he decides to trust the police and calls Philip. Unfortunately, although Dr. Walter has solved the equation, he is unable to separate the specter from Thomas's brother as their organic bodies have merged. Before the call ends, Thomas falls silent. The specter re-emerges and attaches itself to Thomas. The FBI traces the call and rushes to the scene, finding Thomas's brother in a coma with no radiation in his body. The specter has not yet returned after attaching Thomas. To prevent the specter from harming others, Philip makes the decision to end the astronaut's life, letting him him and the Spectre die together. In the end, a high-ranking CIA official approaches Philip, saying they made it clear to the FBI that this astronaut was not to be killed, and now his death hindered their research into high-tech weapons. The official warns Philip that he's in big trouble and then departs. The seventh episode starts with a group of police officers in pursuit of two kidnappers who have abducted a boy and are demanding a hefty ransom from his father. Just when it seems the kidnappers are cornered and the case is about to be cracked, Mysterious events occur as usual. The police officers appear to be controlled by a powerful psychic force. Some jump from buildings like fat birds, some kill each other, and the last one terminates himself. It seems that one of the kidnappers has supernatural abilities. The kidnapped boy, Tyler, is the son of Carson, a powerful scientist working for Massive Dynamic. He admits that due to his busy schedule, he has neglected his son's upbringing and management. He only learns of his son's abduction when the FBI arrives. Dr. Carson has been recently involved in research on drones, so the company's director Nina suspects that the kidnapper's motive might be to extort the drone technology from Massive Dynamic. The kidnappers, needing money for their long journey to evade police, decide to rob a store, but they didn't expect the small grocery store to have a bald but burly bodyguard on duty, presumably due to past robberies. The kidnappers, intending to conserve their energy, have to use their superpowers again. Despite his martial prowess, the bald bodyguard is pretty weak against mind control, possibly because he's too bald to protect his head. He is sent to meet his bald maker outright. The store manager is also forced to end his own life. Tyler, witnessing all this, is terrified. After all, he's a young child who has now witnessed five murders. At this point, Philip investigates the backgrounds of the two kidnappers. Surprisingly, they have been selling cars for over a decade and have been model employees. The fringe team is puzzled by how they suddenly turn to steal high tech. Then, Tyler makes a phone call to his father Carson, saying the kidnappers want a ransom of two million and urging him to deliver it to them. Dr. Carson is bewildered upon hearing this. Nina, on the other hand, is relieved to hear that the kidnappers aren't after their company's secret technology. As for the ransom, it's not an issue. The company can cover the two million. In the lab, Dr. Walter introduces a teddy bear that emits white noise, which can neutralize mind control. Hence, Dr. Walter joins the FBI with the teddy bear to apprehend the kidnappers. Elsewhere, one of the kidnappers snatches the ransom money from Dr. Carson without a word and flees. This is completely contrary to the police's expectations. This guy is quite impulsive. The chase begins, but to everyone's shock, the two kidnappers turn out to be the hostages, while the real kidnapper is Tyler. He meticulously planned his own kidnapping to swindle money, and he is the one with the mind control ability. He even managed to abduct Peter. Dr. Walter's teddy bear proves to be useless against his mind control. Nina asserts that the drone technology Dr. Carson is researching is a form of psychic control. The pilots have been taking a type of psychic drug. Carson admits he once brought some home, which may have been discovered by Tyler. Upon hearing this, Dr. Walter is furious and urges them to figure out a solution to save his son Peter. Tyler has no intention of killing Peter yet because he can't drive. He needs Peter to be his driver. The two of them don't know where to go, and they end up driving to a bar. They watch the performance while enjoying steaks and drinks. It doesn't seem much like a kidnapping. Tyler tells Peter that he's doing this to find his mother. He hasn't seen her since his parents divorced. Back at the lab, Dr. Walter decides to use an electromagnetic pulse against the mind control. Meanwhile, Tyler has found his biological mother, but discovers she has remarried. He thinks his mother left him because of this man. So he controls Peter, planning to harm the man. 
Just in the nick of time, Philip leads a team into the fray. Peter is forced to shoot him in the arm. Fortunately, it's not a fatal injury. Tyler continues to hold Peter hostage and runs. Dr. Walter activates the electromagnetic pulse from behind, interrupting Tyler's mind control, but it can't last for too long. Peter, seizing the opportunity, crashes the car into a tree, knocking Tyler unconscious. In the end, Nina emails Dr. Bell, stating in the letter that the experiment failed. One of the Tylers went mad. Shockingly, it reveals that there are many, many Tylers subject to the company's experiment. The eighth episode begins with the observer observing with his bald head and writing in some unintelligible language in his notebook. This language is exclusive to them, but no one has deciphered it yet. The observer has been watching a girl, looking sorrowful as if something terrifying is about to happen to her. Suddenly, the sorrowful observer leaves his notebook at the scene and walks towards the girl, then kidnaps her. The scene shifts to Olivia, who is preparing to take her niece to the park, but due to this kidnapping case, her plan has to be cancelled. Through surveillance, they find that this observer is not the one they identified earlier. It seems there is more than one observer. These people possess extraordinary martial arts skills, are bulletproof, and can read minds. If there were a bunch of them, it would be like the Avengers. But this is not good news for Dr. Walter, who appears worried. What if these people intend to take Peter away from him? He has to think of a plan to stop that. Elsewhere, the sorrowful observer has the girl bound in a motel room. Olivia investigates the missing girl and finds that she is an art major graduate student, an orphan. Besides that, there's nothing special about her. She mentions the observer only observes and doesn't intervene, except for 20 years ago when they intervened and saved Dr. Walter and Peter from the water. So why did the observer intervene this time? She deduced that this girl must have something special about her. The lab assistant Astrid studies the observer's text and discovers that despite many symbols, none are repeated. This completely contradicts the basic properties of a language, making it difficult to crack. Dr. Walter finds a drop of blood on the notebook and prepares to analyze it. Astrid finds out that Massive Dynamic had researched this text before, so Olivia rushes over. A researcher at Massive Dynamic tells them that he hasn't cracked it either, but this text has appeared many times in various fossils, ancient books, stone inscriptions, etc. What's more fascinating is that they have found the observer in old paintings or photos from 1770, 1793, 1914. These times were significant in history, indicating that these observers not only observe in this era, but can also time travel to observe famous historical events. But recently, they've noticed the observers acting more frequently, which might indicate that something big is about to happen. At this time, the remaining three observers are holding an emergency meeting. They discuss that the course of the girl's life Life has been interfered with and must be corrected. They even send a chubby assassin to kill the girl. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter are at the girl's friend's house. They find an old photo of the girl from 20 years ago. That was the time when a big earthquake occurred and her parents were killed by a collapsing bridge. Strangely enough, the sorrowful observer is in the photo. The scene changes to the sorrowful observer finally revealing the truth. The girl was supposed to be on a plane today, but the plane crashed unexpectedly. In other words, the girl was supposed to die. Surprisingly, the observer kidnapped her just to save her. Although she avoided the accident, she's still not safe. The observer advises her to be patient and promises to save her shitty life. Back to the lab, the blood on the notebook has been tested, and it turns out not to be blood at all, but a type of chili sauce from India. It's so potent that only a few manufacturers make it, so they ask Astrid to investigate. At this time, the sorrowful observer is being criticized by the bald group. They challenge him why he intervened in the mortal world. Are their heads shaved for nothing? The observer is taken aback and says that he was ordered to watch her from birth. He revealed that when he found out the girl was in danger, he realized he had fallen in love with her and couldn't end her petty life. The boss responds that it's sinful indeed. They can forgive him, but this mistake must be corrected and the girl must die. Later, Dr. Walter unexpectedly meets with the sorrowful observer. It turns out the notebook was left by him intentionally, containing a password written in equations. Dr. Walter deciphers it. The observer expresses his hope that Dr. Walter can help him because he has experience altering trajectories. Dr. Walter warns him that it will come at a great cost, but the observer doesn't care. Olivia and Peter, following the lead of the chili sauce, find the observer's home. It seems like they're looking for something. Olivia receives a call saying the observer appeared in front of a motel, so she rushes over. However, at this moment, the chubby assassin shoots the observer. The observer is severely injured and later then gives his gun to Peter. This is no ordinary gun. It can blow people away to a far distance. In the end, Olivia and Peter successfully take down the chubby assassin. When they turn around, the injured observer has vanished. After the incident, the girl is saved.
Philip remarks that the gun the observer gave to Peter is too high-tech. The researchers don't even know how to fire it. It's possible that Peter's shot was the last bullet. In the end, Olivia takes her niece, Ella, to play at an amusement park while the observer watches them. The boss remarks that they could let her be happy for a while, but she won't be able to be happy for much longer. It seems a significant event is about to happen. The ninth episode begins with a young man hurriedly navigating through Chinatown, frantically searching for a place. He appears to be gravely injured. In no time, he locates the place. A mysterious man welcomes him. It turns out that the young man has smuggled himself in from Hong Kong. Everyone else on the ship has perished, and he is the sole survivor. The mysterious man is his liaison, offering him shelter and a place to stay. However, before he can complete his sentence, the young man suffers from intense abdominal pain. The mysterious man turns out to be a surgeon. He calmly lifts him onto a sickbed, ready to perform surgery. As he is about to make the incision, a terrifying parasite with multiple GPS tentacles emerges from the young man. The next morning, members of the FBI arrive at a riverbank following a report. Dr. Walter seems particularly upset. Earlier in the morning, he had told his son that he wasn't a child anymore and could not always be treated like an old baby. As a result, he decided to attend the scene himself. However, he finds Peter following him in a car, which angers him. He even reprimands his son, considering it a sign of mistrust. At the riverbank, 27 bodies lay lifeless. Blood is foaming from their mouths, and some even have parasites protruding from their bodies. These people have no identification and seem to have been smuggled in. They are likely the deceased that the young man mentioned the night before. Dr. Walter plucks a parasite from one of the bodies and hands it to Peter, who reluctantly accepts it. Suddenly, it's discovered that a woman is still alive. Peter, relieved, quickly discards the parasite. Dr. Walter says the parasite hasn't emerged from the woman yet and they need to rush her to the lab. The scene shifts, and the surgeon is seen removing tentacled parasites from a pile of bodies. It seems these parasites hold some importance to him. The team visits the surviving woman. She does not have any parasites in her body, just a bit dehydrated. The woman says they came here to work and for a better life. Surprisingly, Peter converses with her in her native language, which greatly surprises Olivia. The woman explains that after boarding the ship, someone distributed motion sickness pills. Everyone took them except her because her father was a fisherman and she didn't get seasick from when she was a child. As a result, she doesn't have any parasites in her body. She's now worried about her husband and daughter, who are on another ship due to arrive in two days. It's highly probable that this group of people might also be infected. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter is dissecting his new favorite, a tentacled parasite, and has managed to keep one alive. Dr. Walter hypothesizes that the seasickness pills are likely the eggs of these parasites. In another scene, the surgeon extracts an egg from a parasite. Wondering what it could be, he sends a packet of powder to someone named Sun Kong. At this time, the police discover a suspect who is burning documents at a nearby shipyard. The suspect is a gang member with the name Sun Kong tattooed on his arm. As it turns out, Sun Kong is not a person's name, but the name of the gang. The Sun Kong gang has long been involved in the drug trade in the Golden Triangle region. Suddenly, the suspect bites on a blade and takes his own life. Dr. Walter mentions that these parasites contain a lot of anesthetic components which make them ideal for hallucinogens, and these parasites could be used to develop new drugs by the gangs. Dr. Walter decides to test the theory and attempts to consume one, but is stopped by assistant Astrid. In the process, a tentacled parasite bites Dr. Walter. Despite Astrid's efforts to help, Dr. Walter refuses assistance. Instead, he felt pretty good after its bite. After some investigation, Philip discovers that the leader of the Sun Kong gang is currently missing. The arrival of nearly 200 ships in three days complicates the search. They also find out that someone sent $500,000 to the shipping company that had the incident just a day before it happened, indicating that it could be this person who was smuggling these parasites. Consequently, Olivia and Peter rush to the scene. The door is answered by a kid named Matt. His mother indeed invested $500,000, but it was supposed to be for a construction project. It seems she might have been scammed by a fraudulent company. Meanwhile, Peter is walking around the house and later reports to Dr. Walter that the woman's house is spotlessly clean, hinting she might have a cleaning obsession. Dr. Walter suggests that people with asthma disease are most afraid of dust. He also shares that ever since he was bitten by the parasite, not only is he okay, but he has found many new antibodies in his body. 
Therefore, these parasites aren't drugs, but medicine. In traditional medicine, hookworms found in the duodenum can treat asthma, and these parasites are made from these hookworms. The parasites' glands secrete an enzyme that can treat many immune syndromes, which explains why the surgeon wants the eggs from the parasites. Those eggs are immune glands. Dr. Walter is preparing to leave for five herbal stores in Chinatown for further investigation, and he insists on going alone. Peter tells Olivia that he suspects Matt's mother is lying, so they return, but this time, they interact with Matt instead of his mother, because children are innocent. Peter, with his persuasive logic and emotional appeal, gets Matt to confess. It turns out Matt is sick with an immune deficiency disease that can only be treated with the said parasite. Dr. Walter is on his way to an investigation, only to find Astrid following him there. It seems she was sent by Peter. He has no choice but to take Astrid along. Peter mentions that Matt's next surgical treatment is in two days, which is when the next ship is expected to arrive. The doctor for Matt's surgical treatment is a Hong Kong native. Dr. Walter goes to investigate at the said doctor's herbal medicine shop. Dr. Walter comments that his little hookworms are nothing and asks the man to check five-foot-long ones he's raising. Upon hearing this, the man, who is actually the surgeon, becomes suspicious that he might have revealed too much and sends someone to tail the two. However, Dr. Walter intentionally ditches Astrid halfway and goes off on his own. When Astrid returns to the lab, Dr. Walter is still not back. At this point, the person tailing her shows up, steals the parasite, and knocks her out. Dr. Walter is lost, can't find his way home, and has forgotten everything about his phone. Peter and Olivia arrive at the lab to find it in a mess and an injured Astrid. They realize Dr. Walter might also be in trouble. Unharmed, Dr. Walter has been taken home by a Chinese lady, but he doesn't understand why his clothes have been turned inside out. After some inquiries, they learn that Dr. Walter let slip some information, leading them to the herbal medicine shop belonging to the surgeon. In the meantime, Olivia has intercepted a ship with no one on board. She finds an art piece, but they are too late. The group of people has already been moved. Peter quietly heads to the surgeon's place and finds him extracting parasites out from a victim. He bravely attempts a rescue, but ends up being captured and force-fed the parasites. Luckily, the FBI arrives just in time to prevent him from becoming a parasite host. After the FBI investigates, they still can't locate the leader of the Sun Kong gang. Even though they didn't capture the mastermind, the woman's husband and her child were successfully rescued from the gang. In the middle of the night, Dr. Walter wakes Peter up, saying that he'll be acting alone in the future, but doesn't want to wear an elderly badge as it's too lowbrow. Instead, Dr. Walter has implanted a GPS chip in his own neck so they can find him if he's missing again. The tenth episode begins with a recap of the previous events. The shapeshifter stole a frozen skull and revived the person it belonged to. This person had the earpiece marker mentioned by Dr. Bell on the back of his neck. The scene then shifts to an elderly man whose skull was opened by someone. A piece of brain tissue was extracted from his head. Just as the wound was about to be stitched up, the person performing this procedure was discovered and fled away, leaving the elderly man behind. After that, something miraculous happened. The elderly man's mental illness was cured. This man, who had been suffering from severe delusion and had spent 14 years in a psychiatric hospital, was seemingly healed after someone cracked open his head and removed a piece of his brain. The Fringe team took over this case and began the investigation. To their surprise, the old man's doctor claimed that his brain tissue was intact, which left everyone wondering what was the piece that had been removed. Upon reviewing the old man's treatment footage, they noticed that he constantly claimed to see a girl wearing a chrysanthemum on her head and a red skirt across the street. He had no recollection of who performed the surgery on him last night. When the old man's wife came to visit him, Dr. Walter couldn't help but sigh that in all his years at the mental hospital, no one visited him. They pulled up the surveillance footage, and Olivia recognized a face. She explained that she had secretly investigated the organization that lost the skulls previously and found out about the missing skull, even memorizing his face. Peter was shocked, asking her whether the skull in the surveillance footage is the one she was talking about. After comparing the images, they confirmed the skull belonged to a person named Newton who had an earpiece symbol on the back of his neck. Olivia said that Dr. Bell told her that people with this mark are trying to open portals to another world. Once the portals are opened, it would be catastrophic to mankind, and they must stop him. 
Back at the lab, Dr. Walter commented that mental illnesses are hard to cure completely. The old man's case was a medical miracle. He hypothesized that the old man was originally healthy and discovered that his psychiatrist was named Simon. However, there was no such person registered with the medical association. All they could find was an indefinite mental illness prescription Simon had written for the old man 14 years ago. Indefinite meant that once sent to a mental hospital, you would never leave. He had also prescribed the same for two other patients in the same week. This was a clue, and they decided to investigate. Olivia and Peter found the second patient from the prescription list. It's a woman with glasses. She too suffered from severe mental illness, constantly muttering about the number 28. Interestingly, her illness suddenly cured last week. Peter checked the back of her head and found a scar, indicating she had also undergone surgery by Newton. They continued their investigation with the third patient, who was also suffering from mental illness. His condition also miraculously improved two days ago. Dr. Walter discovered that one of the medications Simon prescribed, Tilomilast, is only used for immune reactions after organ transplants and is not helpful for mental illnesses. They wondered if the old man, the second and third patients, had all undergone organ transplants. Suddenly, everything clicked for Dr. Walter. He stated that the technology for brain transplants does not currently exist because preserving the vitality of the brain is difficult. Unlike other organs, the brain would die even if frozen. However, Simon found a way by cultivating brain tissue inside a live human brain, using it as a natural incubator. To counteract rejection, the special medication Colomalast was prescribed to the patients. So Simon divided someone else's brain tissue into three parts and stored them in the brains of the old man and the other two patients, leading to their mental disorders. Recently, Newton has been collecting these brain tissues back. At this point, Astrid received a phone call with shocking news. Simon had visited Dr. Walter six times during his stay in the mental hospital, but Dr. Walter couldn't remember any of it. Peter then found an old scar on the back of his father's head. No wonder his father had been sent to a mental hospital and his mental state was still somewhat abnormal. Understanding the situation, Peter quickly took Dr. Walter to the hospital for a checkup, regretting that he had never visited his father in the mental hospital before. The CT scan of Dr. Walter's brain revealed that there were three pieces missing, which perfectly matched the previous image images of those three patients. This meant that the three pieces of brain tissue Newton had collected belonged to Dr. Walter. They were all parts of the hippocampus used for storing memory. It's revealed that Dr. Walter had previously opened a portal connecting to the other world, but now had forgotten how he did it. This was because of a loss of part of his memory. The team wondered if Newton planned to access this part of the memory to reopen the portals. But Newton would need a matching reader to extract the memory, and that memory reader had to be Dr. Walter. Realizing the danger his father was in, Peter and the team rushed to Dr. Walter's apartment, but they were too late. Dr. Walter had already been taken away. Luckily, Dr. Walter had previously installed a GPS tracker on himself. Peter followed the GPS signal, only to find that the chip had already been discovered and removed by Newton. At the moment, Newton attempted to link the three pieces of brain tissue with Dr. Walter's thoughts, but after several attempts, it did not work. Newton decided they needed to move him to a place that could stimulate his nerves. Back in the lab, Peter suddenly remembered that memory information mentioned by the old man. It's about a girl wearing a chrysanthemum on her head and a red skirt. She was actually a child from Peter's neighbor when they were young, and the number 28 the second patient kept mentioning was Peter's old house number, which was the memory information from Dr. Walter's brain tissue. It turns out their old house was the key for Dr. Walter to figure out how to open the portals. Sure enough, Newton took Dr. Walter to his old house where he used some setups to stimulate his nerves and began reading Dr. Walter's lost memories from the three pieces of brain tissue. As a result, the doctor remembered how to open the portals. Newton quickly obtained the answer he wanted, but it remains unknown to the audience. Right after Newton left, Olivia and Peter arrived, but again, they were too late. Olivia chased after him, took out Newton's two assistants, and was about to catch Newton when he surprisingly poisoned Dr. Walter. To save him, they had to let Newton go. In the end, Olivia chose to save Dr. Walter and reluctantly let Newton escape. When Dr. Walter woke up, the three pieces of brain tissue were dying. Now, he ultimately forgot what he was supposed to forget. The incident concluded, but Olivia was not satisfied. She was so close to catching Newton, but failed. Philip reprimanded her for being too impulsive. In the end, Dr. Walter underwent another checkup, but he remembered a piece of the past. Some memories had returned. It turned out that Dr. Simon was actually Dr. Bell himself, and the removal of the brain tissue was planned by both of them. This part of the memory seemed to be very terrifying and would be revealed later.
The eleventh episode begins with a girl who has been brain dead and kept alive by machines. Her mother, unwilling to let her daughter suffer like this, decides to remove the life-supporting equipment, granting her a peaceful death. After confirming her daughter's death, she decides to donate her organs. However, as the doctors were preparing to remove the girl's kidneys, she miraculously revived. Inexplicably, she kept chanting a series of numbers. This phenomenon was beyond current scientific explanation, so the FBI's paranormal fringe team was called in. Even more peculiar, the numbers the girl was shouting were not random. A naval admiral informs everyone that these numbers are the login password for a nuclear submarine carried on a warship. The officer in charge of this password is a man named Andrew. So the question is, how does a 17-year-old girl who was once dead and has been revived know such a top-secret password? The only thing to do was to ask Andrew himself. However, he mysteriously disappeared three days ago. Unable to contact Andrew, they turn to the girl. She insists she has never seen Andrew before, and she can't remember the incident with the numbers. While they were talking, the girl suddenly started chanting a sentence in Russian, like she was possessed. Peter roughly understood that she was saying something about stars. At this point, the girl's mother wouldn't let them ask any more questions for fear of triggering any frightening memories in her daughter. The admiral mentioned that Andrew also speaks Russian, which indicates there might be a connection between the girl and Andrew. At one point, the girl goes to the bathroom and is terrified to see Andrew in the mirror. The girl's mother drives the FBI away, believing that their constant questioning is causing her daughter to hallucinate. Just then, Andrew's wife appears to answer the question of the fringe team. Stays beside Olivia is her long-dead colleague, Charlie, who had been killed by the shapeshifter. But of course he is not revived here. It's revealed that this episode actually happened before Charlie's death. Andrew's wife mentions that the Russian phrase about stars is a nickname her husband used for her. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter hypothesized that the girl might have experienced a psychic connection with Andrew. However, to ascertain this, they needed to study the girl in the lab, but the girl's mother did not agree. The dilemma was that the girl's mother was a devout Christian, so Olivia attempted to persuade both mother and daughter at the church's entrance. Despite her efforts, she was unsuccessful. Undeterred, Olivia gave them her business card and left. Unexpectedly, she soon received a distress call from the girl. She claimed that hallucinations of Andrew persisted and that a particular location was constantly appearing in her mind. She ran off to this place and witnessed something terrible. Olivia and Peter traced her location and found her with her eyes closed, claiming that she saw someone murder Andrew here, but she didn't see what the killer looked like. Peter indeed found a bullet casing at the scene. Not long after, the police discovered Andrew's body in the trunk of a car. At this point, the girl suffered a seizure and was rushed to the hospital. After an autopsy, the police determined that Andrew had been dead for three days. If he was dead, then how did he communicate with the girl? Dr. Walter asked about the time of death and found it aligning with the girl's resurrection. He hypothesized that at the moment of Andrew's death, a powerful psychic energy was released for some unknown reason. This energy was transferred to the girl, resurrecting her and imparting some of Andrew's memories. A priest overheard their conversation and dismissed Dr. Walter's theory as nonsense, suggesting the girl was possessed and needed an exorcist. Dr. Walter was irate, arguing that few dared to question his science. He remarked that if his character had been introduced earlier, there would have been no need for the 1973 version of The Exorcist. The girl's mother, hearing this, finally agreed to have her daughter studied in the lab. However, Dr. Walter was puzzled about why the girl suddenly had a seizure. He deduced that it might be a condition passed on from Andrew. After consulting with the Admiral, they learned that the submarine Andrew was in charge of had a nuclear leak six months ago, and Andrew was unfortunately irradiated. To cover up the truth, Andrew was secretly sent to Pearl Harbor for treatment. The radiation could not be fully cured, resulting in epilepsy. It was highly likely that the psychic connection between them was due to the nuclear radiation. Dr. Walter decided to try to expel Andrew's memories. This would require medication and possibly surgery. The girl was naturally nervous. Therefore, Peter engaged her in conversation to ease her nerves. They ended up having a nice chat, but without a kiss. The girl asked if Olivia was Peter's girlfriend. Upon finding out he wasn't, she couldn't help but laugh with delight. With all preparations complete, Dr. Walter began the experiment. The girl convulsed momentarily before Andrew's spirit took possession. Olivia explained to Andrew that they wanted to help him find his killer and asked for his cooperation. 
This calmed Andrew's spirit. Andrew shared that he was about to drive out when he found a stranger in the back seat of his car. It was this stranger who had murdered him. Andrew had never seen him before and had no idea about his name, but they had fought and the stranger had injured his arm. Olivia then asked Charlie to investigate if anyone had recently suffered an arm injury. Charlie visited the hospital and sure enough found a former Navy officer named Jake who was now working at a boxing club. He had recently injured his arm. Olivia went to find him. Seeing Olivia and Charlie, Jake turned heel and ran like a broken Tesla bike. However, they caught him within minutes. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter concluded the experiment. The girl was in good shape and wanted some milk, so Peter went to fetch it for her. In the meantime, Dr. Walter checked the girl's brain waves and found her consciousness was still being influenced by Andrew, and Andrew seemed to have the upper hand. This was not good news. To make matters worse, the girl had run away. Jake confessed that he was hired by Andrew's wife to kill her husband because Andrew had been abusing her. Before he killed Andrew, he had explicitly told him that his wife was the one who had ordered his death. However, in the lab, Andrew claimed he had no idea who his murderer was. This clearly suggested he was planning revenge on his wife. Jake pleaded innocence, saying he had no idea Andrew would come back from the dead. Returning home, Andrew's wife found a female stranger standing there. To her horror, the stranger was planning to burn her alive. At the last moment, Charlie arrived and tranquilized the stranger with an anesthetic. This implied that the stranger was possessed by Andrew, who wanted to seek revenge on his wife. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter checked again and this time found the possessed girl had returned to normal. As she was leaving, the girl told Olivia that she was turning 18 soon. If Olivia didn't make a move on Peter, she might just have to. The twelfth episode begins with a police officer on patrol coming across a lost child named Teddy. He decides to drive the boy back to the police station, but halfway there, the boy transforms into a deformed human. It turns out that there have long been rumors of deformed humans in this area, but few have ever seen them. Now there's irrefutable evidence right before their eyes. The officers plan to take a picture and notify the press, but suddenly two deformed humans wielding shotguns burst in, kill three officers, and kidnap Teddy like a teddy bear. Soon after, the fringe team begins investigating the case. They uncover documents revealing that records of deformed humans date back 30 years, with more than 30 instances recorded. All these incidents have occurred in a small town named Edina. The trio head there to investigate. Upon disembarking, they hear a constant buzzing sound. Dr. Walter even starts singing a nonsensical nursery rhyme about Hackney's elephant. Peter asks his father if he made up the song, but Dr. Walter can't remember and just feels compelled to sing when he hears the buzzing. The town mayor tells them the noise comes from a nearby military base filled with large turbines. He is shocked to see the photograph of the deformed boy, claiming it's his first real sighting, as he's only ever heard tales. The trio continues their investigation until late, and on their way back, they're intercepted by a mysterious vehicle. A deformed human steps out and fires at them without a word. But Peter fires back, causing the attacker to flee like a broken Tesla bike. Later, they find the abandoned vehicle. At this time, Dr. Walter finds a beautiful butterfly with blue wings by the road, a rare sight in North America. He catches it and takes it back with them. The police also find a blood trail in the forest, leading them to the man Peter shot. To their surprise, he appears to be a normal human. Peter insists that he shot a deformed human, and Dr. Walter suggests the man might be a shapeshifter. They decide to take the body back to the lab for further study. In the lab, as Dr. Walter prepares to examine the dead man, he receives a phone call from their head officer, Philip, who confirms there is indeed a military base nearby, but it was active in the 1970s. At the time, they were conducting a military experiment known as the Project Elephant, but the base has long been abandoned. Peter realizes this ties in with his father's nursery rhyme and wonders if his father knows something more. But as always, Dr. Walter can't remember anything. Meanwhile, Astrid opens Dr. Walter's toolbox to find an ugly moth instead of the beautiful butterfly. Dr. Walter is shocked, and upon checking the body bag, they find a deformed human, not the normal man they thought they had. It appears both the butterfly and the man underwent a transformation. Olivia compares the fingerprints, but can't find any information on the man. However, they find out that the vehicle belongs to a man who lives in an old house in Adina town. Oddly, there are no photos of him. Olivia and Peter approach the town mayor who tells them the man is a delinquent who had moved, but he's unaware of his new address. 
Inside the lab, Dr. Walter mentions that he seems to remember encountering these deformed humans before, but he can't quite recall. He then absent-mindedly starts singing that nursery rhyme again. Astrid asks whether he made up the song to prevent forgetting about this matter and what the hackney in his lyrics is. Without thinking, Dr. Walter blurts that it's a library. They share a knowing smile, realizing that there might be clues there. So they head to the Hackney Library and indeed find information on the deformed humans. It turns out that Dr. Walter was indeed involved in Project Elephant. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter are still in the small town investigating the man's file. However, all the information about him has disappeared, and they discover that the town's census data is strange. Except for deaths, nobody has ever left or come in. So the mayor's story about the man moving away is likely a lie. At the moment, all the villagers have gathered at the town hall for a meeting. Everyone appears anxious. The mayor tries to reassure them, promising that he will handle everything. His idea of handling the situation is to eliminate everyone who came to investigate. A woman named Rose, who is Teddy's mother and the wife of the man Peter killed, expresses her disagreement. She does not approve of murder as a solution to their problems. By this time, Dr. Walter has learned everything. It turns out that Project Elephant aimed to create invisible people by using electromagnetic pulses to stimulate hallucinations in the enemy's vision, rendering people invisible. However, the project failed because the electromagnetic pulses had a side effect. They caused people to become deformed, a condition that was inheritable. Hence, the existence of so many deformed humans, referred to as the Elephant Man. He also discovers that whenever they step into Adena Town, the moths transform into butterflies. So, the deformed humans never actually transformed. In fact, their attractive appearances were illusions created by the hallucinations. In other words, someone has indeed researched and applied Project Elephant in Adena Town. The humming sound is the sound of the machine running. Dr. Walter suspects that the project was devised by Edward, a scientist he knew. So Dr. Walter and Astrid also come to the town, planning to find the electromagnetic pulse machine. Suddenly, he notices a household resident named Rose and recalls that Edward has a daughter named Rose. It turns out that Teddy is Edward's grandson. Dr. Walter manages to gain their trust and indeed discovers the electromagnetic pulse equipment there. He turns off the machine and instantly, everyone in the town transforms into deformed humans. The mayor, ready to kill Olivia and Peter, ends up losing instead and dies, killed by Rose. She says her father hid the townspeople to protect them, not to commit indiscriminate killing. In the end, Dr. Walter pleads with Philip to not publicize the matter. The criminals are already dead, and it would be best not to expose the remaining people who might be subjected to humiliation, investigation, or even taken for research. Philip replies that as long as the equipment is not discovered, no one will know, and he will not report it. Dr. Walter smiles knowingly. The 13th episode begins when a bald old man arrives at an oil company. Without a word, he lays down on the floor and dies his bald life. Strangely, he opens his mouth not to sing a song, but to release a red gas, shocking everyone present, before dying as a piece of dry soap. Olivia and Peter are thus sent to investigate. Not long into their investigation, a boy starts to bleed from his nose. He doesn't tell anyone and attempts to escape the building. Just then, Dr. Walter decides to enter, notices the boy acting strangely, and blocks the door to prevent him from leaving. The boy farts the same deadly red gas through his mouth and dies to meet his maker. Dr. Walter suggests it's a contagious virus. Despite Olivia and Peter still being inside, the building must be quarantined, so the investigation proceeds from both inside and outside. Inside, Olivia and Peter find an engineer who had come to work on his day off. Peter says it's normal that people love to work overtime, but Olivia disagrees and insists something is off. Just then, a sexy office lady starts to bleed from her running nose, which still looks sexy. It's clear that she has contracted the same virus. She is promptly isolated in a room. The boy had died half an hour after starting to nosebleed. The virus is exceptionally potent, with no apparent incubation period. The situation grows critical, and the quarantined people start to panic like ants being put onto the hot pot. They argue that the office lady had never been close to the corpse. How could she have gotten infected? If it's this contagious, aren't they all infected? Peter tries to calm everyone down. Olivia takes this opportunity to confront the engineer who confesses that the bald old man came to see him that morning. The man was offering to sell him secrets from other oil companies. He planned to leave before the other employees arrived, but got caught in a morning rush. 
but he doesn't know why the old man died suddenly. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter is urgently researching the virus's type and pattern. However, he can't even centrifuge the blood samples. But the good thing is that since the virus can't be separated, it's fragile and likely not airborne. Just then, the infected office lady breaks her isolation, glances at Olivia and Peter, and runs. Peter looks for her, but is surprised when she pushes him from behind and jumps out of a window, ending her sexy life. As she dies, she farts the same red gas through her mouth. Peter is unexpectedly pushed onto the bald man's corpse, covering him in blood. Peter realizes he's probably doomed. He decides to search the corpse for any clues and finds a rented car key. The FBI finds a briefcase in the car and sends it for analysis. At this point, Dr. Walter has a hypothesis. Based on the different reactions of the three deceased, he speculates that the virus has a consciousness of its own. It can control its host and spread the virus towards crowded places. The second victim, the boy, realized he was being quarantined and therefore was forced to break through the door. The office lady, on the other hand, was forced to jump out the window. These actions were all for spreading the virus. The CDC staff opens the briefcase to find a rock core drilled out from an oil exploration. It was this rock core that carried the deadly virus. A senior CDC official says that such a sample should have been stolen, as regular procedures would store it in a sealed protective bag. So, the bald old man who stole the sample didn't understand this and just took it, causing the virus to spread. The rock core was dug out from 16,000 kilometers beneath the ground. Dr. Walter says it's not good. They are experiencing a terror attack from 75,000 years ago. He further explains this virus is the culprit that wiped out all mammals during the Ice Age. Since they now have a sample of the virus, they can perform toxicological analysis. While an antidote may not yet be possible, at least they can diagnose whether a person is infected. So, Dr. Walter prepares to enter the building. At this time, Peter also has a nosebleed. Unfortunately, he has been infected. But when swab diagnostic tests are conducted, Peter cheats and gets through the experiment. By this time, his sanity has already been controlled by the virus. Just as he is about to be taken out of the building, a drop of nosebleed gives him away. He is again pushed back into the building by the soldiers. At this point, the senior CDC official initiates level 7 isolation measures, which means shooting the infected persons directly to prevent the virus from spreading. They simulate a process where, if an infected person were to escape, the world would be destroyed in just two weeks. Upon hearing that his son is infected, Dr. Walter removes his helmet, saying that if Peter dies, he won't live either. He can't lose his son a second time. Time is of the essence, and Astrid decides to join Dr. Walter in researching the vaccine in the building. Dr. Walter says that 70,000 years ago, some mammals survived this catastrophe, proving that there must be a nemesis to this virus. Dr. Walter suddenly remembers that 25 million years ago, there was a massive volcanic eruption. A large amount of volcanic ash blocked the sky, but afterwards, everything revived. Therefore, volcanic ash might be able to kill the virus. But where can they get volcanic ash? Dr. Walter says the main component of volcanic ash is sulfur, so they should first try sulfur. They find mustard in the refrigerator. The glycosides in mustard are rich in sulfur. When they apply a bit of it to the virus, it indeed kills the virus. So, Dr. Walter tells the formula to Olivia, who is outside the building. It takes 15 minutes to prepare the formula. At this time, Peter and the others have lost their sanity and start to smash the door. If the door is broken, it's all over. So the FBI plans to first pump sedative gas into the ventilation system to stun them and buy some time. But because Olivia shut down the ventilation system earlier to prevent the virus from spreading, Olivia volunteers to go in and turn it back on. She even encounters resistance from Peter during the process. Fortunately, Peter only wants to get out and doesn't want to kill her. Olivia turns on the ventilation system and the sedative gas stuns everyone. Then the FBI enters and uses the sulfur formula to cure everyone. The 14th episode begins with two couples about to step into the realm of matrimony. Everyone is immersed in joy. Suddenly, the groom's grandmother points at a bespectacled man and shouts, It's him! It's him! And then she passes away. In the blink of an eye, all of the grandmother's direct relatives drop dead. Satisfied, the bespectacled man walks away with his cheap glasses. The FBI arrives on the scene following a report. Peter notes that the victim's eyes are bloodshot with pinpoint hemorrhages, and their skin has turned blue, indicating they suffocated. It appears they died from some sort of airborne poison. However, it's odd that many people present at the scene are unharmed. Only the groom's direct relatives have died. Peter finds a candle at the scene. This candle has a cinnamon scent, while the rest are jasmine-scented. 
Upon testing, Dr. Walter confirms the presence of poison. This toxin, a form of hydrogen cyanide, can be activated by heat and then dispersed in the air. Dr. Walter mentions the Nazis, saying that they had once endeavored to create a toxin that could target specific groups, like those sharing the groom's bloodline. Moreover, Dr. Walter suggests that the wedding massacre could have been just a trial run for the murderer, meaning the culprit might strike again. Sure enough, nine people suddenly die in a restaurant, all of whom have brown eyes. The toxin was activated in hot tea, validating Dr. Walter's theory. Meanwhile, the same bespectacled culprit is at the scene, watching and flexing his cheap glasses. He instantly recognizes Dr. Walter, indicating there might be a connection between the two. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter studies two types of toxins. The toxin structure is actually quite simple, a combination of chromium trioxide and hydrogen cyanide. However, the culprit has managed to code the molecular formula of the toxin to attack specific groups of people. There's a peculiar aspect to the molecular formula, a carbon chain that resembles a snake. Dr. Walter explains this is the creator's signature. Peter disagrees, saying it looks more like a seahorse. Upon hearing this, Dr. Walter realizes who had developed this molecular formula. It's Dr. Walter's own father, a scientist who was involved with the Nazi party, but acted as an undercover agent for the Allies, secretly sabotaging Germany's nefarious experiments. Dr. Walter says he had seen this seahorse in one of his father's books. Peter panics upon hearing this, realizing he had sold that book for scrap. They rush to the place where the book was sold. According to the bookstore owner, the book had been sold at a high price to someone. Peter sighs with frustration as their search continues, suspecting the buyer might be the murderer. Following the address, Peter and Olivia find not the murderer, but an artist with a fondness for Nazi memorabilia. This guy has used the book to make a collage of Hitler. Peter takes the artwork back to Dr. Walter, who recovers from the shock and inspects it. He extracts fingerprints from the artwork and uses a groundbreaking technique to extract skin DNA from the prints. However, the DNA doesn't match the samples from the crime scene, implying the book never reached the hands of the bespectacled murderer. So, the mystery of how the bespectacled man knew the molecular formula remains. Dr. Walter also makes another astounding discovery using telomere degradation technology. The murderer turns out to be over a hundred years old. Peter concludes there must be a Nazi connection, considering their obsession with purifying their bloodline. The formula would only spare people with green eyes and brown hair, annihilating the rest, possibly including all the bald people. Later, they discover that only three companies have recently purchased chromium trioxide. At one of these addresses, they find a secret room, presumably the murderer's hideout. Olivia finds a picture of the bespectacled man in the trash, suggesting he's creating a fake pass. Another crime scene could be imminent. Suddenly, Dr. Walter struggles to breathe as a heater nearby is burning the poison. Olivia quickly unplugs it, saving Dr. Walter's psychopathic life. Peter discovers a logo on the fake pass's plastic cover. It's for an art exhibition center hosting a major conference today, attracting dignitaries from various countries. The bespectacled man is preparing his toxin, and so is Dr. Walter, working around the clock to develop a countertoxin. In a nail-biting showdown, Dr. Walter manages to develop a countertoxin first, using it to kill the bespectacled man just in time, who must have regretted wearing a pair of cheap glasses, but not a gas mask for protection. After the incident, the doctor tells Philip that if he wants to arrest a murderer like him, just do it. But he has to kill him because the man was misusing his father's research. But there's one lingering mystery here. How did the bespectacled man know the molecular formula if he never saw the book? In the final scene, Dr. Walter pulls out a photo of his father. The man in the background is none other than the bespectacled man, who was actually the assistant of Dr. Walter's father, and the man had lived for over a hundred years. As for why, that remains unknown. The 15th episode begins with a salary man named Ted, who is brewing a cup of coffee for a late-night work session. Suddenly, an earthquake-like tremor shakes the building. When he recovers, he finds himself with an extra pair of hands and feet. Confused, he wonders if his boss rewarded him with extra hands for him to work harder. The fringe division arrives at the scene, baffled by the sight of two buildings seemingly forced together. The horror intensifies when they enter. Everyone inside has become a mutant, with two heads, two hands, two legs, and possibly two hormone weapons, as if they've been squeezed together. They discover Ted, who's still alive but in a bad state. Knowing he's not going to make it, Ted insists on making a phone call to his wife. However, after Philip checks, he finds that the man is single. Still, the man insists that he's married to a top-tier celebrity. 
Scanning their surroundings, Dr. Walter comes up with a theory, thinking the man might not belong to this world. He asks Ted which building was targeted in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, to which he responds they are the Pentagon and the White House. While the others believe Ted is delusional, Dr. Walter realizes what's happening. However, Ted dies soon, and his stomach moves like a pregnant lady. Upon checking, Dr. Walter finds another version of Ted inside, who also dies before he can sneeze. Dr. Walter theorizes that for some reason, two parallel worlds have collided, causing two objects to occupy the same space and become one. Olivia suspects Newton, whose skull was cryogenically revived in a previous episode, has always wanted to open the portals to two worlds. Sure enough, footage from the scene reveals Newton gleefully watching the chaos. Dr. Walter recalls an old experiment he conducted with Bell, where they sent a car to another world. Eleven minutes later, another car appeared and merged with a statue. Though the cars were different, their weights were similar, suggesting a principle of mass conservation between the two worlds. Dr. Walter predicts a building of similar weight will be transported to the parallel world, leading to another tragedy unless they can predict which building it will be. Dr. Walter says the only one who can predict this is Olivia. When an object is about to travel between worlds, or has already done so, it emits a faint light that only Olivia, who underwent the cortexophon experiment when she was young, can see. However, this ability seems to have disappeared. To help Olivia remember and regain this ability, the trio visits her childhood kindergarten. It was here that Dr. Walter conducted the cortexophon experiment on the young Olivia, and so Olivia is injected with the same drug and hypnotized once again. In the illusion, Olivia finds herself in a vast forest, with shadows flitting around her at random intervals. It seems she's not alone here. Suddenly, the day turns dark, and a chilly wind starts to blow. Under a tree, she spots a huddled girl who looks terrified. Upon inquiry, she's shocked to find out that the girl is her younger self. Just as suddenly, the girl disappears. When Olivia turns around, the girl has turned into a frightening figure with scary eyes, which startles Olivia awake. She wakes up still unable to see anything out of the ordinary, but she remembers Dr. Walter conducting experiments on her when she was young, which makes her furious. That night, Olivia secretly discovers Dr. Walter watching old footage of the experiments he conducted on her. In the footage, she's extremely scared, cowering in a corner. Dr. Walter mentions that this was the first time Olivia saw the other world and set a house on fire with her mind. Suddenly, Dr. Dr. Walter realized that the experiment was successful back then because Olivia was scared. Now, it's not working because her fear has turned to anger. Emotion is the key, and her current emotional state is not conducive to success. Olivia is frustrated. She's been fearless after going through so many horrible paranormal events, so they need to think of another plan because this isn't working. So the trio returns to FBI headquarters, planning to use scientific statistical methods to identify the building. The method involves examining architectural blueprints to identify all buildings that may have a similar weight to the one that was involved in the incident, then checking them one by one. But time is against them. Dr. Walter estimates that they only have a few hours. Philip mentions that there are almost 200 buildings on the list, with the largest one housing over 500 people. It's impossible to evacuate everyone without causing citywide panic. Olivia confides in Peter about her situation, how she could have saved these people, but now she has to watch them die. Peter tries to comfort Olivia, using his sweet words first, and juicy tongue later. But suddenly, Olivia says it's time because she can feel her fear is triggered possibly by his smelly tongue. She rushes to the window and looks out, spotting a building that's starting to glow. That's the one. Philip immediately makes a call to evacuate the area, and Olivia also rushes to the scene. The building's glow is becoming even more intense. Right after the last person escapes, a blinding light flashes, leaving nothing but the building's foundation behind. As predicted, the building has been transported to the parallel world. As the episode ends, Peter and Olivia have to continue where they left off with the passionate kiss. They plan to go on a date, but after a shared look, Olivia realizes that Peter doesn't belong to this world. However, she decides not to mention it. Dr. Walter pleads with Olivia not to tell Peter. He doesn't want to lose his son again. The 16th episode begins with Dr. Walter's memoir, shedding light on how his son Peter from the alternate universe ended up in this one. In the year 1985, Dr. Walter is conducting a secret meeting with top-ranking officials of the U.S. military. He presents a Motorola flip phone, a high-tech gadget for 1985. It turns out that this phone was brought back from a parallel world. In addition to this, Dr. Walter has invented a window that allows one to glimpse into the parallel universe. Looking through this window, one can see a massive Kirov airship floating over the Empire State Building. 
Various pieces of evidence suggest that the neighboring parallel world might be more technologically advanced. Back to the present, Dr. Walter brings Olivia to the viewing window, hoping she could understand his actions. He begins to tell her about his terrifying past memories. Back to 1985, Dr. Walter, using the viewing window, observes his alternate self in the parallel world. It turns out that Peter, in both worlds, is sick with a disease that the medical field currently cannot cure. The parallel world is more technologically advanced, so maybe the parallel Dr. Walter could find a cure. After several days of watching, however, there's no success. Peter, in this world, couldn't hold on and passed away. During his burial, Nina arrives and mentions that Dr. Bell couldn't make it as he's in a meeting in London. The death of their son is hard to accept for Dr. Walter and his wife. Seeing his desolate wife, Dr. Walter can't bear it and shows her a paralleled Peter through the viewing window. Dr. Walter comforts his wife, saying so now she knows there's another Peter who will grow up somewhere else. He will be very happy, so they should mourn appropriately and continue to live. Despite his words, Parallel Walter still hasn't developed a cure. At this rate, Parallel Peter will still die in the Parallel World. Dr. Walter watches his experiments daily, silently rooting for him. One day, while Parallel Walter is working on a new formula, the same sorrowful observer mysteriously appears and strikes up a conversation with the doctor, possibly because he's too lonely and sorrowful. Just at that moment, the new formula starts to take effect. However, Parallel Walter, engrossed in his conversation with the observer, doesn't notice the change in color. Success often comes in a fleeting moment. By the time Parallel Walter finishes his conversation and checks the results, they seem like usual. Thinking that the experiment has failed again, he discards the formula. All of this, however, is witnessed by Dr. Walter in his own world. The scene shifts to the two observers who have just finished watching a Daniel C.C. movie, Back to the Future. They are in the midst of a heated discussion about the plot, mocking that humans are such fools because they choose to believe this thing could travel to the future. At that moment, the sorrowful observer approaches them, saying that he made a mistake. He was observing Parallel Walter's historic moment, but their conversation happened to distract him from successfully finding a cure to save his son, and now Parallel Peter is in danger. The other observers warn him that due to his distraction, he's changed the course of history that he's not supposed to intervene, so now he must correct it, getting it back on the right track. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter is busy working with his assistant of that time, who is the one who would perish in the lab fire, after which Dr. Walter would be suspected of murder and confined to a mental institution in the future. Now, his assistant asks him what he is doing. The doctor says he had observed the entire process and only he can create the antidote to save the paralleled Peter, which means that he needs to go to that parallel world. Upon hearing this, the assistant tries to dissuade him, warning him of the consequences of opening that portal. But Dr. Walter ignores her warnings. After preparing a bottle of antidote and choosing the location for his journey, it's Lake Reedon, because he saw from the viewing window that Parallel Peter's mother took him to a lakeside villa, and the lake water can absorb excess energy. Without a choice, the assistant reaches out to Nina, hoping that she can convince Dr. Walter. Just as Dr. Walter is about to open the portal, Nina appears, saying she was also devastated by Peter's death. But he can't doom the world to save one person. She also says that Dr. Bell has called her many times to stop him, but Dr. Walter dismisses her bullshit. With that, he activates the portal. Nina lunges at him, but to no avail. Dr. Walter is too strong. He crosses over to the parallel world, and Nina's arm is broken in the process. Unexpectedly, the antidote Dr. Walter brought to the parallel world shatters upon his arrival, and parallel Peter's condition is critical. With no other choice, Dr. Walter decides to bring Parallel Peter back to his own world for treatment and then return him. He pretends to be Parallel Walter and tricks Parallel Peter into believing him, and they cross dimensions. But just as they arrive, the ice on the lake cracks open, plunging them and the dimension-crossing machine into the water. They're about to drown when the Observer intervenes and rescues them. This ties up with the previous storyline. The Observer says that Parallel Peter is not supposed to die, and this this is the situation he worked so hard to intervene and correct. He urges Dr. Walter to make the antidote for Parallel Peter, watch him closely, and never let the tragedy happen again. Later, Dr. Walter successfully creates an antidote and saves Parallel Peter. At that moment, his wife comes looking for him and sees her son. She embraces him immediately, but Dr. Walter reminds her that this isn't their child, and he has to send him back to his world. But it turns out, he never does as he said. After all, people are soft-hearted, and Peter feels like their own son. So this is the first portal that Dr. Walter opened in the past, leading to more frequent interactions between the two worlds.
The 17th episode begins with a man named Neil. He pays a visit to a restaurant where he meets a childhood friend from kindergarten, Miranda. Neil reveals that he is suffering from a serious illness that doctors can't cure. However, he was told by a hermit that he might be saved if he reconnects with his kindergarten classmates. The only classmate he remembers is Miranda, so they meet. Miranda wonders if there might be a miraculous healer among their classmates. After recalling over 20 classmates, they remember a boy named Becker. He left a strong impression because he once forced Miranda to eat bugs with him. Upon hearing this, Neil speculates that Becker could be the miraculous healer due to his peculiar eating habits. He thanks Miranda by touching her hand. However, this contact results in Miranda breaking out in bubbles all over her body, and she dies instantly. Dr. Walter is called to examine her. He notes that the bubbles resemble cancer, but they are on the surface of the skin rather than below it. He speculates that if it is cancer, the cancerous tissues would appear different under black light. After testing this theory, he confirms it. However, he also notices red marks that resemble fingerprints. He theorizes that someone touched Miranda and transferred the cancer to her. Dr. Walter decides to amputate the affected arm to extract the fingerprints. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter investigate Miranda's case but find nothing. Olivia seems distracted throughout the inquiry. When they are alone in the lab, Olivia tells Dr. Walter that she can't keep the truth from Peter any longer, but Dr. Walter begs her to wait until he is ready. After his research, Dr. Walter hypothesizes that the person who touched Miranda alleviated their own condition by transferring their cancer to her. Elsewhere, Neil knocks on Becker's door. Shortly after, Becker also dies from the same bubble-like symptoms. Neil has, in turn, passed the disease on to Becker. On the way back, Peter notices that Olivia is acting strangely, but he doesn't think much of it. He assumes that his attempt to kiss her a few days ago upset her, so he reassures her that everything will remain the same as long as they don't kiss using their tongues. He confidently adds that she will be his eventually. The police discover that there have been five similar cases over the past 20 months, all resulting in death due to the bubble-like symptoms. The cases are combined into one investigation. As Olivia examines photos of the victims, she recognizes one of the names. She recalls a height chart from their kindergarten with all the children's names next to it. She had copied down all the names, and when they cross-reference the list, they realize that all the victims are on it. Neil's kindergarten classmates are all children who participated in Dr. Walter's cortexifen experiment, including Olivia. The murderer seems to be systematically killing those who were part of the cortexifen drug trial. Neil heads to Nick's home next. Nick is the mind-reading man who led a group of people to jump off a building in an episode of season one. He's currently in police custody and is not at home. The door is answered by his aunt, who appears to be the next potential victim. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter has extracted the fingerprints from Miranda's arm, but they can't be found in the system. Nick's aunt tells Neil that six months ago, a beautiful woman came looking for Nick. She also claimed to be Nick's classmate. After that, Nick was never seen again. When Neil heard this, he felt as if he had found what he's been looking for without even trying. He decides to find this beautiful woman first. Luckily, Nick's aunt remembered her name. It's Olivia. In the meantime, Olivia calls her superior, Philip. She figured out that the first victim died after seeing her cancer-stricken brother, who is actually Neil. Then the female victim mysteriously died. Both her brother and she attended the same kindergarten. Therefore, Olivia plans to go to the hospital to investigate. As she was leaving, a man comes to find her, claiming to be Neil. Olivia senses trouble the moment she hears this, so she resists. They end up wrestling their muscles. Since Neil has cancer, he's no match for Olivia and her heavy body. Neil then reveals that when he was in the hospital, a man visited him and told him that his cancer could be cured. He also revealed the kindergarten experiment. Then one day, a strange thing happened. His sister came to see him, touched him, and died instantly. After that, he felt like his cancer improved a bit. This is more effective than chemotherapy, but it only works on those who have undergone the cortexifen experiment. That's why he planned to find his childhood classmates. Philip and Nina analyzed that someone was hired to activate Neil's power, but it failed, resulting in the current situation. Therefore, they decide to quickly find the remaining subjects of the cortexifen experiment. Perhaps each of them has superpowers. In the end, Olivia visits Dr. Walter and tells him that she will listen to him and not tell Peter the truth yet. She is also afraid of losing him. The 18th episode begins with an old man who suddenly appears on a train to flex his balding head. It seems that he is intending for something sinister. The old man gets off the train and encounters a begging child, but he doesn't have time to deal with him and walks away. 
After the child boards the train, he is scared out of his wet pants because everyone in the train car is dead looking like mummies. The scene changes to Dr. Walter, who is writing a letter to Peter, detailing his life story and stowing it in his pocket to give to Peter at an opportune time. Just then, he receives a call about a case. So the fringe team starts investigating this peculiar event. Dr. Walter examines a few people and finds that every passenger appears to have been instantaneously drained. Even all the electronic devices are out of power. In other words, all energy in the whole train car has been drained. The doctor is completely puzzled. Then the surveillance video is brought up. This old man naturally also enters the police's radar. If everyone is dead, why is he the only one alive? Inside the lab, Peter is having a conversation with his father, who has been evasive for the past week. Something is off, and Peter suspects his father is hiding something. The police have been tracking the old man through surveillance footage, but he mysteriously disappeared after leaving a coffee shop. Not even the most comprehensive surveillance could capture him. They decided to investigate the coffee shop further and found that the old man had paid for his coffee with a bank card, which had detailed personal information. The old man turned out to be Peck, an astrophysicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The FBI subsequently raided Peck's home, which was empty but filled with complex mathematical formulas. Dr. Walter identified these formulas as describing the movement of subatomic particles, Einstein's theory. This indicates that Peck might have turned this theory into reality. Surprisingly, Peck showed up at this moment admitting that he was the cause of this dire situation. He claimed that the people have not truly died and he would revive them. He asserted that they had no right to arrest him. Dr. Walter then noticed that Peck's body was wrapped in numerous metal objects, some intertwined with copper wire and flesh. He realized that Peck had created a Faraday cage around his body, a technique known for blocking enormous energy barriers. Suddenly, Peck swayed and instantly moved to a train. It turned out he had invented a time travel machine. When he disembarked, he apologized to the begging child for scaring him again. Everything else was as before, except this time, Peck did not return home. The team searched his home. Olivia and Peter, holding a picture they found of Peck with a woman, visited MIT and asked his colleagues about him. A female professor told them Peck was researching time travel and identified the woman in the photo as Peck's fiance. She also handed over three manuscripts that Peck left behind. After looking them over, Dr. Walter discovered that Peck might have indeed achieved time travel. He had completed Einstein's theory, successfully reversing the continuity of time and space. However, this required a tremendous amount of energy at the moment of traversal, which could have killed those passengers. At this point, Olivia found out that Peck's fiancé had died in a car accident 10 months ago. They suspect Peck was desperate to research time travel because he wanted to return to the day of his fiancé's accident and save her. Dr. Walter said that given the energy consumed so far, he could probably only travel back 12 hours. The consequences of trying to go back 10 months could be catastrophic, potentially requiring the sacrifice of hundreds of people. Dr. Walter empathized with Peck's actions, as he had done the same himself to save Peter. At this time, Astrid discovered that although Peck's fiancé was dead, her mobile number was still being topped up regularly, which indicates that Peck might be the one using it. Thus, the FBI located Peck's hiding place through GPS positioning. It was at an MIT lab. To prevent him from time traveling, the police decided to shoot Peck on sight. But Dr. Walter volunteered to talk to Peck alone, hoping to persuade him to abandon his idea of time travel and prevent further harm to innocent people. Peck explained that he felt helpless without his wife and would not live alone. He reassured Dr. Walter that a few minutes before his fiancé's accident, he was in a deserted field where no one would get hurt. Dr. Walter, who had also crossed lines to save Peter, shared his experience with Peck. He said he was unsure what to do now and hoped for a white tulip from God as a sign of forgiveness. However, Peck said there was no God, only science. Knowing he couldn't persuade him, Dr. Walter pointed out that Peck's equations were missing a few terms if he wanted to travel that far back in time. Peck made two more time jumps. The first was to calculate the new equations. Before the second jump, he wrote a letter to Dr. Walter, then returned to the day of his fiancée's accident. Instead of saving her, he chose to die with her in the car crash. This suggested that Peck took Dr. Walter's advice. At Walter's point in time, he received the letter, which contained no words, only a hand-drawn tulip. Dr. Walter cried in tears. This was the sign from God he had been waiting for. It seemed Peter's secret would have to remain hidden for a while longer.
The 19th episode begins with a young man taking his girlfriend near an abandoned building, possibly to engage in some intimate but smelly activities. Suddenly, the young man felt the car shake and asked his girlfriend if she noticed. She shrugged, joking that they would be shaking the car soon anyway. Right after she said that, something exploded in the building. The young man went to investigate and found a shape-shifting creature, poking it with an object. As he prepared to poke it again, someone from behind twisted his neck and sent him straight to meet Satan. It turns out, it was a shapeshifter from a parallel universe, who then took on the young man's form. There was more than one shapeshifter. Another one took on the girlfriend's form. The scene shifts to Dr. Walter, who, after much deliberation, finally decided to tell Peter the truth. However, his difficult confession was interrupted by a phone call from Olivia. They rushed to the scene of the incident along with Olivia and Philip, finding two naked bodies, a male and a female, with three circular puncture wounds on the roof of their mouth. Without a doubt, they knew the shapeshifters were back. They then noticed the shapeshifting creature on the ground. When Dr. Walter cut open its outer wall, mercury flowed out. It's clear this was the third shapeshifter that failed to transform and was stuck in the embryonic stage. The FBI received a report that there were abnormal TV signals near the building when the incident occurred. They reviewed the recorded video from that night and found some sounds repeating many times. Thinking this might be a language, Olivia and Peter went to Massive Dynamic to find answers. The scientists there told them that these were not language, but waves from a parallel universe, similar but not identical to the waves in our world. The two worlds are not synchronized in time, but at certain moments, they could synchronize instantaneously. The next synchronization was calculated to be at 3.31 the next afternoon. The scene shifts to Newton, who takes three personnel files and instructs the two shapeshifters to disguise themselves. The girl jokingly compliments Newton on his mathematics skills, since they're down one member but still proceeding with the mission. Newton says that if they miss the opportunity tomorrow, they'll have to wait seven months, and the minister can't wait. Newton decides to take on the mission of the third shapeshifter, and the others should just do their part. Newton goes to a bank, where the bank manager greets him. They plan to hide a device underground in the vault, implying that the bank manager is another shapeshifter. Back at the lab, Dr. Walter manages to reactivate the shapeshifter embryo. However, despite being activated, the embryo dies after a few spasmodic movements. Before dying, it apologizes to the minister for failing to transform into the coroner. Upon investigation, Olivia discovers that the said coroner works at a downtown hospital. They bring him back to the police station for investigation, but he's not a shapeshifter, of course, because the shapeshifter that was supposed to transform into him is dead. Therefore, Newton has to take over the coroner's mission. Newton fakes his death to infiltrate the downtown hospital and places another device in the morgue. After investigation, Dr. Walter suddenly realizes Newton's true intentions. He plans to place harmonic signal generators at three locations. These devices will vibrate at a frequency that matches the harmonic signal of the parallel world at exactly 3.31 the next afternoon. At this moment, the object in the center of the triangle formed by these three points will be swapped. The reason three shapeshifters were sent here is because these locations require specific identities to access, like the bank and the hospital. The third location is this utility pole, where the shapeshifter disguises as a worker and places the last device. At this point, the fringe team discovered the body of the bank manager. So one of the locations is at the bank. Another is at the hospital where the coroner is based. Having determined two points of the triangle, they're only missing the last one. But there are two possibilities. Peter sketches on the map, one is a park and the other is an abandoned bridge. Upon hearing this, Olivia says it must be the bridge, as the river water can absorb excess heat. Peter is taken aback, asking how Olivia knows this theory. The three of them, armed with a sonic disruptor, rush to the bridge. The two shapeshifters have transformed into police officers, but Olivia recognizes them instantly. A fierce firefight ensues. Amidst the chaos, Dr. Walter drives the car onto the bridge, preparing to disrupt Newton's signal. At the critical moment, the program malfunctions. Peter comes to help and sends his dad away as this energy could rip a man apart. They watch as the two worlds begin to swap and a bridge materializes. There's a faint figure appearing on it. An FBI agent is consumed by the energy between the two worlds. Before the signal fully stabilizes, Peter manages to cancel the program. The bridge from the parallel world vanishes abruptly. Peter is knocked unconscious by the immense impact. A day later, Peter wakes up from his coma. Dr. Walter visits his son cheerfully, but Peter says there was a person on the bridge. That must have been the person Newton was trying to transport. The person was unharmed under the resonance energy, but the FBI agent died. 
Peter continues, saying he too was unscathed, so he must not be from this world. He accused his father of going to the parallel world, taking him back and trapping him here. Dr. Walter tries to explain, but Peter doesn't listen. He just wants to be alone for a while. In the end, Newton is seen performing surgery on someone. This person is the one who didn't make it across earlier. From his words, it's clear this person is the same minister mentioned by Newton and also his top boss. Apart from this, Peter leaves the hospital without notice. It appears he also needs time to calm down. The 20th episode revolves around Dr. Walter's heartache following Peter's disappearance. As a result, he takes a massive dose of custom-made medicine, which makes his imagination run wild. At this point, Olivia brings her niece Ella to the lab, hoping Dr. Walter and Astrid can watch her. At first, Dr. Walter plays a game of doctor with Ella. However, Ella doesn't enjoy it because Dr. Walter kills his patient. In a quandary, Dr. Walter decides to tell Ella a story he made up set in the 1940s. The protagonist of the story is Olivia, a private detective tangled up in affairs of the heart. When she picks up a picture of her lover, it appears they've broken up. Dr. Walter uses a song to express Olivia's feelings, but it doesn't go over well. Dr. Walter then continues the story where the fringe team are the characters. One day in the 1940s, a client comes to Olivia's office, pleading with her to find her missing fiancé, Peter. On the other side of the city, Peter is seen with a stolen glass heart, a matchstick in his mouth. Olivia seeks help from Officer Philip, who is singing in a bar. He claims he's never seen Peter. However, Olivia then pulls out another piece of paper given to her by the client. Philip identifies it as the logo of the massive dynamic corporation. Olivia then visits the corporation's director, Nina, who warns her to stop investigating because Peter is a wicked and dangerous man. After Olivia leaves, Nina makes a mysterious phone call. When Olivia arrives at her client's home, she finds the client murdered and her heart removed. The police investigate and discover that the client uses a fake name. From her notebook, Olivia finds Dr. Walter's phone number. She visits his lab and realizes that Dr. Walter is the real employer who wanted to find Peter, who is his lab assistant in this story. Dr. Walter states that although they share the same last name, there is no blood relation, but he always regarded Peter as his own son. Dr. Walter is an inventor, creating everything from bubblegum pajamas, rainbows, and even hugs. He also invented a device that allows a corpse to play music. He reveals that the glass heart is his invention and that he lives because of it. However, Peter stole it. Without this heart, Dr. Walter will soon die. All these elements hint at Dr. Walter's genuine feelings outside the story. The scene shifts. Astrid is job hunting, but the interviewer ignores her. So she starts to sing. Suddenly, Olivia calls. It turns out she used to be Olivia's assistant, and she wants Astrid to help her. Unexpectedly, an observer appears before Olivia, threatening to cut open her chest and take her heart. He even uses a special tool to make a cut on her chest. Astrid helps Olivia clean the wound and discovers that it's healing automatically. Such technology only belongs to Massive Dynamic Corporation. Upon investigation, Olivia finds out that the observer was sent by Nina. Confronting Nina, Olivia hopes for the truth. Nina, however, claims to know nothing and doesn't even recognize the bald observer. Naturally, Olivia doesn't believe this and continues her pursuit, implying that the real Olivia also doesn't trust Nina in real life. Olivia discovers Nina using a peephole to converse with Dr. Bell in a parallel world. Then, Olivia is knocked unconscious by the observer and locked in a coffin filled with water by Nina and the observer. Of course, the protagonist won't die. Olivia is rescued by Peter. He takes her back to his place and shows her a map full of pins. Peter says that his boss, Dr. Walter's inventions are not his own ideas, but ideas stolen from children's dreams, replacing them with nightmares. This hints at the crises caused by Dr. Walter traveling through parallel worlds in real life and the experiments on children. Peter tells Olivia the truth. The glass heart doesn't belong to Dr. Walter. It's something he was born with. He lived with Dr. Walter and developed feelings for him, so he wanted to give him the heart. But after learning that Dr. Walter stole children's dreams, he took the heart and decided never to see Dr. Walter again. Suddenly, a horde of observers burst in and took Peter's glass heart. As Peter was dying, Olivia, desperate, inserted a battery into Peter's body. But even after the installation, Peter remained unconscious. That's when Olivia realized she was in love with him, but Peter was dead as shit. Heartbroken, she began to sing a sad song. Then, Peter came back to life. Olivia and Peter went to Dr. Walter's lab and saw him holding Peter's glass heart. Dr. Walter was puzzled how they could know he was the culprit. Olivia said she saw the flash grenade used by the observer in his invention book. Dr. Walter longed for Peter's forgiveness, but was coldly rejected. 
At this point, Ella protested that Dr. Walter's story ending was too sad, so she decided to create her own alternate ending. It goes this way. Peter looked into Dr. Walter's eyes and saw a kind side to him. He split the glass heart in two, and surprisingly, both halves continued to function. This way, both of them could survive. Everything was wonderful. After the fairy tale story, Olivia returned, saying she hadn't found Peter. Astrid took Dr. Walter home. At this time, the sorrowful observer informed his companions that Peter wasn't with Dr. Walter, expressing his concern. The 21st episode begins with Peter running away from home. He ended up in a coffee shop in Washington, where he met a waitress who could engrave music discs. After some persuasion, the girl agreed to engrave one for Peter and deliver it to him for free. However, after working overtime to finish the engraving, she was kidnapped by a mysterious person. Peter waited all night at the hotel front desk, but she never showed up. Deciding to go back to his room and get some sleep, he received a phone call. When he answered, there was no one speaking, just some crackling noises. Peter decided to move on. Passing by the coffee shop from the previous night, he saw a police tape. He hadn't even asked a few questions before he was arrested by the police because the disc engraving girl had been killed. The shop attendant claimed that she had gone out to deliver the disc to Peter and never returned. That is to say, the police were looking for Peter and he had delivered himself to them. Peter said he was not the killer and claimed that the hotel front desk could vouch for him as he had slept there all night. The deputy made a phone call to confirm and verified Peter's alibi. However, they didn't release Peter as they suspected him of deliberately creating an alibi. The sheriff drove to the location where the girl's body was found. Peter heard on the car radio that the girl's skull had been opened and a part of her brain tissue was missing. This sounded a lot like Newton's method. Peter called over the sheriff and asked her to ask the coroner if the missing brain tissue was the temporal lobe. It turned out it was. The sheriff realized Peter was not a common fellow. Upon checking, they found an FBI badge. Peter said he was from the Fringe Division. The sheriff then called the head officer, Philip, who confirmed Peter's identity. And thus, Peter went from being a suspect to a senior detective, beginning to investigate the case. Since the same killing method was used, it seemed that Newton was behind it. Peter wondered if the perpetrator's motive was to extract the girl's memory and find Peter's hiding place. Perhaps the mysterious phone call at the hotel was made by Newton. Peter bought a gun and was fiddling with it in his room when the mysterious phone call came again, still filled with crackling noises. Peter asked the sheriff if anyone else knows where he lives. Instead, they received a report that the deputy had disappeared. More strangely, there were no records of the two mysterious phone calls Peter spoke of. The sheriff said the deputy was her closest person, and this case had exceeded her imaginations. She decided to call the FBI immediately, but Peter disagreed as it would bring his father into it. So, he said he will help her solve the case. Over at Dr. Walters, distressed due to Peter's disappearance, he causes a commotion at a supermarket, showing signs of a potential mental breakdown. Meanwhile, his home is in complete chaos. At this point, Peter and the sheriff arrive at the last place the deputy was seen. Suddenly, Peter hears a crackling noise coming from deep within the forest. He follows the noise and stumbles upon Newton and his men. An intense fight breaks out, ending with Newton's escape. Upon hearing the sound of gunfire, the sheriff rushes over to find Peter bleeding from his arm. She quickly points her gun at Peter, suspecting him to be a shapeshifter. However, it's confirmed that Peter is human. Peter tries to explain, but this exceeds the sheriff's understanding. While she could accept the idea of brain tissue extraction for memory, the concept of shapeshifters baffles her. At this point, they discover a body at the bottom of a cliff. The temporal lobe has been extracted just like the others. A terrified sheriff moves closer, and thankfully it's not the deputy, but a female stranger. Peter examines both bodies and finds spikes in adrenaline levels twice between their disappearance and death. The first spike wasn't too high, presumably when they were kidnapped, and the second one reached its peak, likely at the time of death. These adrenaline surges were likely due to fear. If they could determine the time between the two peaks and make speed calculations, they might be able to locate the place of death. The sheriff suggests that the death locations might not be the same. Peter disagrees, stating that extracting brain tissue requires extremely precise conditions and the location can't be moved easily. After calculations, they narrow down a suspicious area, which contains an abandoned dairy farm. Upon arriving at the farm, the owner offers to fetch the keys. However, Peter discovers a disc in his home, the one the girl had engraved for him. Something's off about the farmer. A fight ensues and Peter manages to subdue him. The farmer confesses that he can't control himself and feels compelled to dismantle the brain cells of the girls he sees. He doesn't understand why. Upon hearing this, Peter wonders if this case has nothing to do with Newton and is merely a coincidence. 
Inside, they find the deputy, who is still alive, bringing this part of the story to a close. The scene shifts to Olivia arriving at the lab and revealing she knows Peter's location, likely informed by Philip. In the end, Peter decides to listen to some music to ease his mood when Newton suddenly appears and takes control of Peter. Then another figure appears. It's the minister mentioned by the shapeshifters previously, who is none other than Peter's biological father, Dr. Walter, from the parallel world. This explains why Newton has been so intent on creating a portal that traverses two universes, because parallel Peter's real father wants to take him back to his own world. The final two episodes begin with the long-dead officer Charlie, who is surprisingly still alive and has shaved his head, making a dazzling comeback. Following him, Olivia also shows up with a new hairstyle. It turns out that this is a parallel world where every character has roughly the same occupation as the original world, but with slight differences. Apparently, a crisis event has occurred in this parallel world. A wormhole crack has appeared in a large theater, and they have found a man riddled with cancer who has already died. This man is actually Neil, whose superpower is triggered, and through that, he can pass his cancer to others. Parallel Olivia finds a banknote on Neil's body, but the person printed on it doesn't match this parallel world, proving that he had crossed over from the original world. At this point, Olivia and Dr. Walter, along with two other people, are secretly observing from the shadows. The plot seems a little bit confusing here. To clarify it, let's move back to a day earlier, when Olivia and Dr. Walter set off to Washington to find the missing Peter, only to discover through surveillance that he was taken away by Dr. Walter from the parallel world and vanished. The only place he could go is the parallel world. Peter has finally returned to where he should have been all along. Although Olivia and Dr. Walter are saddened, they are helpless. As Olivia is drinking away her sorrows, an observer places a piece of paper next to her. It has a drawing of a giant device with a man standing in the middle, and at the bottom is Peter, with red light shining from his eyes. Dr. Walter says that after he brought Peter back, the sorrowful observer had warned him never to let Peter return, or else the world would be in chaos. Olivia asks what this has to do with the piece of paper. Dr. Walter says that Peter might be about to cause the end of the world. This is no small matter, so Philip takes the lead and brings a group of people to find Nina for advice. Nina looks at the paper and recognizes it as something Dr. Bell once showed her, saying it could destroy the world. However, the massive dynamic corporation has never made such a device because it's impossible to create. Based on the blueprint, it seems that only Peter can operate this device. Since it doesn't exist in this world, it must be in the parallel world. Hearing that, Nina panics. If it's really the end of the world, the only solution is to cross over again and bring Peter back. They think it should be easy and suggest they let Bell bring him back. However, Nina says that Bell has crossed these two worlds too many times. His body's atoms have become overly active from being repeatedly disassembled and reassembled. If he crosses over again, he will explode into mashed potato. Dr. Walter says that his method won't work either. The last time already caused a crack. If he tries again, it could cause an explosion. Olivia suggests that she could go, as she has been to the other side before. Dr. Walter replies that it won't work. She was only there for a few minutes last time. This time it would take much longer and she doesn't have enough energy. Upon hearing this, Philip says that he can find some energy for them. It turns out that he has secretly been collecting children who have been treated with cortexafan and activating them. Among them, three stand out. Besides this girl, the other two are familiar. They are Nick and Neil. Olivia has a premonition that this journey is more dangerous than it seems, so she visits her niece, Ella, and her sister late into the night. Early the next day, everyone gathered at the opera house. Olivia sought out Philip, mentioning that Nina had already informed Dr. Bell to meet at a bridge in Central Park at 4 p.m. Philip suggested that Bell might have defected, possibly aiding the parallel world in building the giant device, since Massive Dynamic hadn't constructed it. However, Olivia chose to trust Dr. Bell. Once all preparations were made, the group released the cortexafin energy and crossed over. Unfortunately, Neil, unable to withstand the strain, suffered a recurrence of his cancer and collapsed, dying on the spot. The girl also felt unwell. The rest of them hid before the police arrived and observed from the shadows, connecting the plot to the beginning of the story. Parallel Olivia had already investigated the banknote found on Neil's body, discovering it was genuine. At this time, the defense minister of the parallel world urgently summoned the Fringe Division. Unexpectedly, the defense minister in this world was Dr. Walter's parallel self. Parallel Walter stated that several invaders had come from the other world and they must be captured. 
The scene switches. The four of the time travelers planned to take a bus to find Dr. Bell, but it turned out that local buses required an ID card to ride. With no other choice, they decided to walk. Meanwhile, Peter woke up in a luxury villa and was surprised to see his mother feeling deeply moved. In another world, his mother had killed herself due to intense psychological pressure 10 years ago. His mother told Peter that his father was still busy, but she had a piece of paper for him to look at. The drawing on the paper was of the giant device. Although the technology of this parallel world was advanced, they couldn't understand this unseen technology and wanted Peter's help. At the appointed time, the foursome arrived at the bridge, but instead of waiting for Bell, they encountered the police. Nick and the girl chose to self-destruct, injuring the team leader of Parallel Olivia. Dr. Walter and Olivia got separated in the police blockade. Dr. Walter got shot and was critically injured, but with his status as a minister in this world, he was promptly treated in a hospital. With nowhere to go, Olivia went to her own house, only to find her parallel self inside, romancing her boyfriend. Just when she felt that there was nowhere to hide, Bell tapped her on the shoulder. He had gotten Nina's message, but by the time he reached the bridge, it was already surrounded by police. Dr. Bell told her that she had to trust him now. Dr. Walter was lying in the hospital, and if his cover was blown, it would be all over. They had to rescue him quickly. Bell, who was doing well in this world and had helped the Defense Department develop many cutting-edge weapons, decided to distract the paralleled Olivia and Charlie who were coming to the hospital, allowing Olivia to find Dr. Walter. With Bell's clues, Olivia found Dr. Walter in no time. However, Dr. Walter was suspicious and asked her to prove that she was the Olivia from his world. Olivia, impatient, told him to get his smelly butt up and move. Hearing this, Dr. Walter was assured that it was indeed his familiar Olivia. When parallel Olivia checked the surveillance, she found that the minister had been abducted by herself. On the other side, parallel Walter is talking with Peter, hoping he'll help construct the giant device. Only then can this shattered world be repaired. Upon hearing this, Peter agrees to help, seeing it as both a simple task and a heroic act. Just as they're discussing, Parallel Olivia arrives. After Parallel Walter sends Peter away, he explains the hospital situation to Olivia and asks her to continue the pursuit. Meanwhile, the three of the time travelers are discussing how to bring Peter back. With only Olivia left from the Cortexafin children, it appears the same method can't be used. This world also has a lab where Parallel Walter once studied how to travel between two worlds. They hope there might be something useful left there. Hence, Olivia decides to find Peter, while Belle and Dr. Walter drive to the lab. On the road, there are many amber-like objects, used as patches to mend the space-time rifts caused by Dr. Walter due to his last time travel. Both worlds have these, but this parallel world has it worse. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter blames Bell for how he used the technology of this parallel world to create massive dynamic, gaining both fame and fortune. Meanwhile, he was locked in a mental hospital for 17 years and even had a piece of his brain removed by Bell, leading to his current cognitive impairment. He asks why Bell didn't team up with his parallel self to rule the world. Bell remains silent, mentioning that his parallel self died in a car accident years ago. As they chat, they find a usable device. Meanwhile, Olivia barges into the home of her parallel self, intending to ask for her help. Only then does she learn that her mother in this world didn't die, but her parallel sister did. Therefore, they both feel that the people most precious to them are dead. Although their conversations seem to be going well, Parallel Olivia pulls out a gun, stating they're nothing alike. Indeed, they're different. One has a distressed and vengeful personality. The other is lively, open, and cute. This leads to a fight between the two, so intense that it's hard to follow. In the end, Olivia knocks out her parallel self and has a clever idea. She pretends to be her and deceives Charlie, saying the minister urgently needs to move Peter. Over at Peter's, he is studying a component of the giant device. After much research, he realizes that the device seems to respond to organic matter and that only he can activate it. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. It's Olivia and Charlie. On seeing Peter, Olivia immediately knocks Charlie out. She reveals to Peter that his minister father has deceived him. The purported repair is actually the destruction of another world, and the giant device is a machine of destruction. Olivia also confesses her feelings for Peter, saying she brought him back not to save the world, but to be with him. The high and dry two are sealed with a passionate kiss, but without using their smelly tongues. They then rush to the opera house to meet up with Belle and Dr. Walter. 
At this point, the police from the parallel world also arrive. Bell assures them there's nothing to fear. He had supplied the police with 76 series pistols, but he has kept a 77 series, a far more advanced one for himself. He quickly takes them down, but then runs out of bullets. Luckily, Bell hands Olivia a super grenade, which wipes out the rest. Dr. Walter says that the device needs more energy than Olivia can provide. Bell tells him not to worry. He has been traveling back and forth between the two worlds. His body has become like hundreds of atomic bombs. He will send them back. Before their departure, he doesn't forget to rebuke Dr. Walter, saying that the establishment of massive dynamic and the extraction of his brain tissue were all Dr. Walter's own ideas. In the end, Bell sacrifices himself, helping the trio successfully return to their own world. Upon their return, Dr. Walter asks Peter if he plans to go back again. Peter replies that after shuttling back and forth between two worlds, he needs a break. The drama ends with Olivia entering the typewriter room and flicking her hair back, revealing a tattoo on the back of her neck. It's revealed that she is the paralleled Olivia all along, who has been masquerading as Olivia and infiltrated their side, while the real Olivia has been locked up by the parallel Dr. Walter in the parallel world. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.